Good evening. I'd like to call this November 28th, 2023 School Board Special Meeting Work Session and Close Meeting to Order. Ms. Goodell, could you take the... Dr. Anderson? Here. Dr. Dimmick? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Dr. Gould? Here. Dr. Ortiz? Here. Ms. Silverman? Here. And Ms. Tice? Here. Thank you. Thank you. If you could please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're at 1.04. Adopting the agenda. If I could have a motion to adopt the agenda. Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, Chair, I move to adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you. Could I have a second? Thank you, Vice Chair Gold. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries and we have an agenda. And we're now at our, our work session 2.01 FY 2024 legislative priorities and I'll turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, uh, Chair Downs. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight on this very cold and windy uh, evening. Um, we will uh, roll through the agenda as quickly as uh, and as efficiently as possible so that you won't be too cold by those windows for the night. Uh, but we are very fortunate tonight to have back with us uh, Patrick Finneran. Uh, Patrick has been uh, our legislative liaison now for uh, about six months and is, uh, or so, and has done a great job sort of uh, meeting with all of you in different um, settings. Uh, we've now had an opportunity to kind of go through um, the, the cycle, if you will, of uh, VAS, VSBA, and then the legislative breakfast. And as a consequence of, of those, in addition to some things that you all have brought forward, with respect to your legislative positions, um, I think we're getting really close to a final package, or maybe we have a final package um, that is uh, ready to go and to be adopted at the next regular meeting. But before we, uh, before we do that, um, this evening, uh, Patrick is here. He's got a, a really nice presentation that he'd like to share with you and uh, that's in your board docs along with um, the draft 24 legislative priorities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Finner. Thanks for being here. Uh, Vice Chair Dr. Gould, our Legislative Chair, um, Lori Silverman, and other members of the board, and, and everybody um, who's gathered here and watching on uh, on the internet. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Falls Church School Board and Dr. Noonan and, and staff for um, you know their their insights uh, about the upcoming General Assembly session and really helping bring forth this just still draft program, a legislative program, um, and. You've seen, you've seen and heard a lot of it already, so I'll go through it fairly rapidly, but if there's some things you want me to stop at or you have questions, just please go ahead and, and do it whenever you'd like. Um, and first thing, just, just to take a quick look at the timeline, and uh, let's see if we can get there. There we go. Um, this is a budget session. Uh, it starts January 10th. Uh, it should end March 9th. Uh, you know, but last year I think we actually had uh, the final end in September, <laughs> so we're hoping it goes a little bit quicker. Uh, December 20th, we'll see the governor's budget proposal. Um, for those of you who go, the PTA, PTA Legislative Day is on the 19th. Uh, the VSBA Capital Legislative Conference is on the 22nd, and the, in late April, hopefully, we'll have a veto session and be done. You'll know what your budget is going to be and all the laws you can get started on. So hopefully that will go as planned. Uh, here's a listing of the uh, draft legislative positions. Um, in the yellow are the new legislative positions. Um, those not highlighted are your con are continuing positions. So I'm not really even going to go over those unless you have some questions. Uh, they're very important, but I think you've been through them at least one or two cycles uh, before. Uh, the two green ones are also continuing, but they have a lot of bearing on uh, all the yellow ones, especially the rebenchmarking and the jail arc study. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, first position is to talk, just talks about implementing the jail arc recommendations. That Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission uh, did an incredible um, uh, survey and study of K-12 funding in Virginia compared to across the nation. And they found uh, what I think a lot of people know, you all, you all knew, 
uh, is that it, it's, it's underfunded in Virginia, 14% um, less than other states on average, and that equals $1,900 per pupil. So if you do the quick math, uh, I'm not a mathematician, but I think I can do this. It equals about, uh, I figure 2,700 students, equals about a little over $5 million um, in additional dollars for Falls Church every year. So that's not a one-time number. Um, I think JLARC presented a variety of near-term near uh, recommendations to correct long-standing inequities, such as um, removing the cap on adjustments to um, uh, non-personnel cost assumptions, uh, including all division central office staff in the SOQ formula, eliminating the support cap, which I'll talk about, uh, restoring the cost of competing funding for all support staff, and some others. And what this essentially would do was would, would roll back and undo those cuts that were made uh, during the Great Recession of 2009, 2010, and, and moving forward from that. So that's one of the big kind of, kind of talk about, uh, look at this as a kind of a trifecta of things. There's the governor's budget, this JLARC recommendation, and then rebenchmarking. And those three things don't always come together like that. And so it's a really big deal, I think, this year in terms of how we look at money and how the state's going to look at money. Um, I keep going too far, don't I? I just want this. All right. Technical problems here. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Uh, I think one more. There we go. So rebenchmarking, um, I think you all know this, so tell me to be quiet if, 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 you, if you want to just keep going on, but it's really, it's, it's a technical adjustment that, that happens every two years, and it funds, it helps, it looks at um, all the costs that have changed, and they could go up or down, depending on whether we have more students in the school system, in, in the state, um, uh, a big one, of course, is, is inflation now. So there's a lot of different adjustments, a lot of different data points they look at. Um, the bottom line is it, it will fund all schools in Virginia for the next two years and really be the base for you know, every year after that. So it's very important that um, the state gets it right and provides all the funding that's due to the school divisions. Um, interestingly, the Senate Finance and Appropriations met um, last month, and they, they looked at a number of $1.6 billion over the biennium. The House looked at $1.3 billion. There's just different ways you can count these things. Um, but the Senate um, kind of uh, provided a major caution. It said there are some one-time funds that will not count towards rebenchmarking this year, or may not count. And that would bring the rebenchmarking from $1.6 billion over two years down to $416 million. So that's the size of the one-time costs. Uh, it, but those were costs were real, real to the local school division. So I think it's only fair that we ask that the Senate and the House look at including the one-time costs in the rebenchmarking as well. And also look at the JLARC recommendations. There's a lot of JLARC recommendations, that study I just talked about, that talk about rebenchmarking and how things are done. So if they could look at those two things, um, I think we would get dig, or, dig out of that hole of dropping down to $416 million. Of course, the governor's going to release the budget. We'll see what his number is for rebenchmarking. The House is going to have to do it. There will be three competing budgets at some point. Um, but it's very concerning, I think, that this one-time funding could be taken out. And that $416 million over two years would be probably one of the smallest rebenchmarkings we've seen. Uh, teacher recruitment and retention, boy, this is something everybody talks about. Um, we are now in Virginia, we have, I think it's more than 1,000 unfilled teacher positions. And that doesn't just mean there's unfilled positions, it means that there's kids without a qualified teacher in, in classrooms across, 1,000 classrooms you know, across Virginia. So this position just looks at trying to bring teacher pay up to the national average. Right now it's about $9,000 below the national average. 
we rank. Uh, I have 40th nationally. I've also seen 22nd nationally. Again, it's how you count numbers and how you count certain things and which years you use. But we're, we're way below the national average on teacher pay. Um, and everybody knows the teacher you know, shortage is, is very severe. I think you're probably doing pretty well here in Falls Church, hopefully. But across the state, it's, it's a major concern. And it just um, need, need to kind of try, try to get a handle on that. Now, we do have to thank the General Assembly for putting a lot of money towards P teacher pay. But unfortunately, inflation and other states putting a lot of money at the same time has kind of kept us in the same spot. So just looking at teacher pay. Uh, eliminating the staff support cap. This is another um, area that um, back in two, FY 2010, so 2009, when the Great Recession was starting, um, the state said, well, we, we can find a way to, to save hundreds of millions of dollars by just not paying for all the support staff that school divisions say they have. And so they artificially, uh, and kind of arbitrarily, put a cap on number of support uh, uh, staff support positions that they would pay for um, that has been in the hundreds of millions of dollars every year uh, statewide um, at, at lost education now they've done a good job in the past two years of bringing that that cap up from 17 uh, which it was down to 17 positions per thousand that are funded and now it's 24 per thousand they the experts say that fully eliminating the cap um, will increase the funding ratio to approximately 26 per thousand. So about two support positions per thousand, uh, and that would be additional um, uh, support staff for the school division should you choose to hire them. Of course, it's only the state share of the, um, of the amount that they give you. So it's not, not even a full position. But. Standards of quality, these are uh, formulas that drive school division uh, staffing ratios and the distribution of state basic aid and other requirements. Uh, <coughs> both the Virginia Board of Education and the JLARC report call for the SOQ to be updated. Uh, there's about um, probably seven or eight that have um, not been updated yet and they're listed below. It's additional funds for students in poverty, mentoring for teacher leaders and principals, additional ELL teachers, uh, work-based learning coordinators to help our kids get careers, um, and, and additional support staff and counselors. So that's getting back to the uh, support staff as well. So uh, hopefully the, the um, General Assembly will see fit to try to, uh, reinst uh, try to approve some of those that have been recommended by both the, the State Board of Education and JLARC. Um, Three new ones, um, uh, and these are the last of the new, new ones, um, student meals, history, and accreditation standards. And the student meals really, I think, is, is something that's been sought in Virginia for the past few years, just trying to bring uh, universal free lunch and breakfast to every student, regardless of which school division they're in. And there are some school divisions that have um, that are under a federal program, the community el eligibility provisions, because of their um, high poverty level, they're able to get into that. And so every student, regardless of income in those communities, um, has free or reduced lunch. Other communities cannot get into that because they don't fall under the right guidelines. So you have, you have some people who would really benefit from a free lunch, free, free, free breakfast that can't. So this is, um, it, it kind of it, it it's currently limited uh, to stu you know to, to school divisions participating in that community eligibility provision program, but there's a bill that was uh, introduced last year um, that would have required all students to be eligible for free meals regardless, and of course there'd have to be a state budget amendment for that as well. So that did not pass, uh, obviously. Um, history and social sciences standards. I think this is pretty straightforward. This um, is a, a kind of a common sense uh, uh, approach to just looking at the full scope of history in Virginia, um, including diverse pers perspectives in the standards of learning as they're presented to our students. Um, and just as simple as that. Um, but there have been some, some 
I think some concerns over that not happening or being attempted to uh, kind of circumvent some of the full history that, that we have in this state. School accreditation, um, this just supports the preserving, which the state is already doing, preserving the use of, use of growth measures um, in accreditation standards. So taking a look at how far a student has progressed along his or her educational path over the year, um, instead of just measuring them one time at one point in the year and saying you've passed or failed. So seeing if they've, they've made some significant measure and using that as a way to um, count towards the school's accreditation, sta uh, accreditation status. So I think that's really, uh, oh, this is really one of the most interesting slides. I don't know why I thought, I forgot about that one. Um, this is from the uh, Senate Finance and Appropriations. And, you know, we, we kind of know what our wish list is here. And this gives us a, a little glimpse into the wish list of the uh, Senate Finance and Appropriations, which is, of course, the, the big money committed, committee on the Senate side. I haven't seen one from the House. Um, and the Senate uh, really uh, has a strong interest in all this, all this uh, fiscal uh, and money issues. So they, again, re-benchmarking, looked at a, um, possibly lowering it to $416 million. We'll, We hope that won't happen. Um, looking at a few things here, some special education. And I think we heard this a little bit um, in the, uh, at the legislative breakfast, looking at a statewide individualized education plan system that some legislation is going to be introduced on that. Uh, so I'm going to need to be um, in, in, in touch with Ms. Sharp um, very closely as this comes out and see if you like it or not. Uh, but that's one thing they do want to work on, uh, a data system modernization. They, they said in, their, um, in this report, they're looking at uh, an item of interest is full removal of the pre-recession support position cap. cap. So that's good news if they can uh, focus on that. Uh, and then support for spe specific student populations at risks, um, students, ELL uh, students, and early childhood, and I know uh, ELL uh, uh, support is one of the concerns that's you know already existing in your legislative package. So these just show some of the what's on the the wish list possibly of the Senate Finance Committee, and it kind of gives us a look into where that might go. Of course, we'll see the governor's wish list in another three weeks or so, and then we'll we'll just move from there. So that, that's my, the end of my presentation right now, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions or uh, see if I can answer anything or take suggestions for this program and see which, if you have any other concerns. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Finneran. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm really interested in HB 1967, the uh, free meal mm -hmm. um, idea. and. You know, I was thinking about it. Each meal is not very expensive, but when you have, let's say, two, three, four kids in school, it's over $1,000 a year if your kids buy lunch every day and, you know, add breakfast into that, and you're looking at significant uh, costs on the families. Just curious if you could read any tea leaves, what you think of the chances of that passing. Uh, they're going to have to look at the, at the dollars. I mean, that, that's going to be the bottom line, I think. Um, they're going to take a look at what school divisions are in the currently in that uh, community eligibility program and see so and, and take that out as something that wouldn't have to be funded by the state but if they're going to mandate something above and beyond what's available through the federal government the state's going to have to be responsible for it or at least be a partner with local you know local school divisions so uh, there's a lot of sentiment I know to make this happen um, but I'm not I, I couldn't I couldn't say it'll happen with all the other competing interests um, but it's something we can certainly keep on top of yeah and I was just I was just curious on um, what you thought um, but you did mention just now that you think it might be a joint expenditure between the state and, and localities or you do you, or is there talk more of the state doing it fully well I, th I think there was talk of the state doing it fully um, but of course as negotiations proceed 
and the numbers, you know, the, it'll be a big number because um, it's a big number for um, every household and you multiply it across the state, it's, it's a big number. Um, so I, 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 really, I really don't know. I, but I think it's going to be, it'll start out probably I think as a state number and then if it runs into some problems, there may be some look at whether school divisions would want to participate in it. Maybe it'll be an optional thing. School divisions can participate um, with the state money, but have to put in some of their own money, but not be required to. So, and we've seen other programs like that around the state. Thank you. So, but any money coming for that would be subject to the local composite index, is that right? Uh, that's a little unclear at this okay. point. Um, you know, they use that formula for just about everything. Right. And if they were to do that, it, and that was part of the partnership, mm. uh, you know, we'd be on the hook for 80% of right. whatever that is. So I think we'd need to really have some good long discussions about whether or not we wanted to, to make that happen in our community and at what expense. What are we trading off for it? If it, if it does become a shared, you know, it'll be interesting to watch. I think it's going to be an interesting session this year. Um, I, I'm sort of picking up what you, on what you're asking. I almost said what you're putting down. Um, but I'm sort of picking up on what you're asking. And I think we're going to see a lot of legislation that in some ways is going to be aspirational, um, that is going to make it through both the House and the Senate, and may or may not make it past the governor's desk. Um, and so I think you may, we may see some things like universal um, universal lunch and breakfast uh, only to be you know either pocket vetoed or feet vetoed or 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 or, or signed who knows but um, that, you know with with the two chambers not being in sync with the governor's office it'll be fascinating to watch this year and with very slim majorities so there's yeah yeah um so and, and just uh could you get, do a 30-second um, explanation with the local composite indexes sure. for those listening? Yeah, for those, for those people who are listening at home, um, the local composite index essentially is the um, overall measure of wealth of a community. Um, and, and that overall relative wealth is then calculated into an index that defines how much uh, a locality is responsible to pay for those things that are in the standards of quality versus the state's uh, amount that they pay in the, the standards of quality. So for example, um, if we have a teacher that is funded through the SOQ, the standard of quality, and that teacher for round numbers um, costs $50,000, um, because we are, our, our local composite index is a 0.8, which is the highest um, it could be, it means that we're responsible for 80% of that $50,000 um, and then the other 20% is picked up by um, the state. So, so you'll see in that, in that process, you know, the state would pay for roughly $10,000 of that teaching position, and we would be responsible locally to pay for $40,000 of that teaching position. The challenge for Falls Church City and, and other school divisions around the Commonwealth, frankly, is that the standards of quality, one, are underfunded, and two, don't always capture the staff, or actually it's probably better to say never capture the staff that is in a school uh, division. So when we in Falls Church decide to keep our per pupil ratio at a really low number, at say 22 or 24, it means we're gonna have more teachers than the state requires us to have. Mm -hmm. And anything additional and above and beyond what the standards of quality fund, we have to pay 100% of. So um, in, in that case, and let's just take school counselors mm -hmm. as an example, let's say we have 10 school counselors and the standards of quality funds 20% of six of them, that means we pay 80% of the cost of the six of them and we pay 100% of the cost of the additional mm -hmm. four. So um, it, is a, it is a challenge for us with the local composite index, um, but it's an important thing for us to recognize mm -hmm. Um, and this is where our partnership with the city council really has to be strong um, because ultimately um, as the funding body for our schools, it's important for, for uh, them to also be aware that, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the playing field that we're on and um, for us to be able to fund our schools effectively and efficiently, um, we do end up paying more than what the, the state requires. Right. Thank you. And, and I, you know, I think it's important to know too because sometimes you'll hear i remember during covid you know all this money coming from the state but quite often 
the catch was that it was subject to the local composite index so that we didn't have, you know, so I think it's just important sometimes for the, to read the fine print that we don't get when that money is said right. it's coming from the state. That's not necessarily what we're A receiving. A really great example of that just happened. Um, and, and some of you may know um, that the state sent out um, mm -hmm. uh, information saying that everybody's going to get a 2% mm -hmm. raise. Mm -hmm. Well, for us to give a 2% raise, let's just say it's $800,000 to give a 2% raise, the, the state is giving us 20% of that money, and we have to pick up 80% of that money. So 80% of the money on the $800,000 2% raise comes from the locality, and so we aren't able to give the 2% raise like other localities are, around the state because we just don't have enough enough money right thank you very much and I, I guess we also probably should have started to just let the public know that um part of this too we had a really nice breakfast with um, arlington county um, public schools and Al alexandria city public schools and this is something we've done for a number of years um, and sort of working together and um, you know generally all of our systems are on the same page but it's really good uh, several members of our board were there um, and I think that's um, also where we I think it was Arlington that came up that um, we saw what they had um, their position on the teaching of history which I thought you and I w were very impressed with so it's really I think a great um, collaboration with our, with our local systems and uh, Dr. Noonan if you could just also explain so growth measures, and, and Mr. Fenner, and I think you're saying that's, that's not going to go away. We're, we're thinking that that will stay. I think it's a question. I okay. think that that's why it's in your legislative package, okay. is we want to put as much down pressure as we can on the legislature to influence then the state board as well to keep growth measures in. Because I, you know, I, don't, I don't think this board believes this, and I don't believe it, that it's fair to take a student who has been in the country for four mm -hmm. years, had no... Um, no schooling in their home language in their home country come here at 12 and say okay at 14 or 15 you have to take the standards of learning in English and if you pass it great if you don't pass it it's a fail mm -hmm. we would rather take that kid from where they are and show four five six years of growth which wouldn't necessarily get them to the benchmark to pass the SOL by that age right. time but it would show tremendous right. growth um, over time and I just think it's a fairness and equity issue right. that we need to pay attention to because English language learners are still taking the SOL as the same as someone who was born in the US correct and, okay uh, along with special right. education students right. too, with a with a, um, a very small very very small percentage of students that aren't okay so right so that that's very important and, and it is definitely an equity issue in terms of you know being fair and showing the whole, not holding every it's an equity piece Making sure that they're sh growing and that should. If account. we all started at the same place, it'd that's be a right. Different story. Thank you. But we Thank all you. Don't start at that's the same right. Place. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Vice Chair Gould. Yeah, I appreciate you coming in person as well. It's always sure. good to connect. Um, you mentioned about the difference in the uh, one-time funding as a uh, calculation for over a billion dollars in difference. Mm -hmm. Can you just describe what would be possibly the reason for including one-time funding? Because I imagine that some people would would find logic in not including one-time funding in the calculation. So what is the argument for including one-time funding in the uh, sure. re-benchmarking? Yeah, I think, I think both sides will be argued. I think um, some of the logic for including it, or including some of it, uh, is that school divisions spent that money. School divisions used that money. School divisions needed that money, and that's not going away. Uh, one example, I think, is uh, on a federal level, um, a lot of federal money came in for uh, some uh, allowed school divisions to use laptops. Now, this is uh, to, to bring, bring uh, uh, school divisions up to a one to one computer ratio. That's, that money's going away. And it's, there's going to be like a cliff that we fall off of in terms of funding. But that money and that funding, th those needs are still there. So I think that's the, um, that's the argument to say, let's not just take all the one-time funding out because it was you know it's, it's called one-time funding let's say you know what what did school divisions do with it how was it used and um, look at really why school divisions do need that money in there and I think um, I think they'll if they do that they'll see that there's a lot of reasons to include that money in the rebenchmarking and we've had you know rebenchmarkings over a billion dollars in the past uh, this is not something out of the ordinary. 
So, um, I, but I think you know this this could be. Um, it, it'll be a point of contention, uh, but I, I do think that the fact that school divisions uh, use the money, they didn't just they didn't put it. It's not in a safe savings account somewhere to be used later. Uh, used it on everyday spending throughout the school year for operating and, and whatnot. So, um, I think that's the argument that needs to be made. It wasn't frivolous money that we it wasn't it wasn't. Um, you know, so we didn't do some things that we, we, we wanted to do. We did things we needed to do. So, does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, this is, I think, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Mr. Farron. I think this is more for Dr. Noonan um, and, and the team. Um, uh, the, the way that the teacher shortage response is framed is in terms of salaries and obviously you know money is a is a big you know <laughs> it's a big component of of um, how a person feels about his or her job um, but I think that what you know what I've heard from teachers as well as just read throughout the, the, the trade press and the press is that the demands on teachers have gotten a lot heavier and um, and you know some of this has to do with you know various standards that are imposed, et cetera. And so it's a, qu a question I have is the degree to which actually we have either latitude within the district to ease some of that. Now easing that obviously has budget implications, but I think that's the whole point um, of having this discussion. Or alternatively, if there's legislative activity that would be appropriate to ease that burden. In addition, because I think you know part of feeling underpaid, as I said, is feeling that you're being asked to do more for the same amount of money, or effectively with inflation less. So I just I, I don't know if there's I don't know if you have answers to those questions, but I think that that probably be worth exploring a little bit in terms of kind of making our ask a little bit more discreet, or even two types of ask with respect to addressing the teacher shortage. I think you raise an interesting question, Dr. Ortiz, and and as I think about. Um, the teaching profession and meet with teachers and talk to them about what are those um, burdensome things that feel overwhelming that potentially could put you off of, of teaching, for example. Um, it really, in some ways, um, boils down to how teaching has changed over the last 25 years. And I think it is a consequence of sort of high stakes testing and standards. Not that we shouldn't have standards, I think we need to have standards, but um, this, it's, there was once sort of this blend of the art and science of teaching um, where you could walk into a classroom and in some ways it was as much an art as it was a science. And I think in some ways where it's gotten to now is it's much more scientific than it was previously. There's a lot more data, there's a lot more information that goes into decision making relative to um, best practices for curriculum and instruction. There's more intervention because we now know with more accuracy which kids need intervention. Um, more extension and acceleration for kids than we may have done in the past because we have more information. Um, and I do think um, to alleviate some of that burden, it does become in some ways sort of a uh, budget issue because I think one of the ways to sort of back out of some of that is to have more support there for some of our teachers and I think that's the value of some of the folks that we have for example at Oak Street Elementary like the, the Katie Reardons um, and the Larkin Epsteins the math specialists and the reading specialists that can help sort of cut that data and ask a, instead of asking teams of teachers to do it themselves they can come in and say here's what we're seeing in the data um, and I think that that's been very valuable and also sharing with them some of those best practices. But I, I do think it is a, it is a challenge um, and th that's sort of the teaching side of it. And then I think the challenge for us also is the, um, uh, it continues to be and has been my entire career, is sort of the community aspect of it as well and sort of expectations on teachers um, relative to individualizing educational programming for every student in their class, whether they have an IEP or don't have an IEP. Um, and you know some of that is we're, we're in some ways victims of our own um, discussion saying that we want to meet every kid by name and by need and and by saying that out loud in a, in a timely and tailored way and by saying that out loud that raises the expectation of others to say well you know uh, you know you've got these you've got my kid in your class you've said you're going to meet the needs of this particular individual student and I think 
providing differentiated instruction 28 different ways in an, or 24 different ways in an elementary classroom is much more challenging than it's been in the past. So I think those are some of the lifts that our teachers are being asked to um, to get into. Um, and, and I think that on top of sort of this high stakes pressure of um, accountability adds, adds to that. So, um, but I do think it does ultimately turn into, you know, in some ways sort of a, a budget, a budget conversation. Thank you, Dr. And thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Other comments? Yes, Ms. Tice. I have, I think, is a fairly cut and dry question. Um, and I know under the issues, electronic meetings was something that we have asked about before and it's not new to the list. Um, I was just wondering if you could, it says um, that would support the option for school division advisory bodies to meet electronically. And are we asking to expand the options? Because there is a way for me certain members to meet, or is it for the entire committee to meet? What is the specific ask? Because I know there have been some expansions or relaxation of the rules recently. Sure. So it, it there might be some experts more expert on this than, than I am but my understanding is that a lot of the the, the concern is that uh, if there are school board members on these committees then there's a higher bar to meet in terms of meeting electronically it has you have to meet certain con, you know certain conditions and considerations uh, than if there were no school board members on there so I think that's 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 you know, and I could, I could, there's actually uh, uh, another school division I was looking at has a, an incredible overview of this issue um, and, and why they want it changed, and I could get that and, and send that to you. But it's, um, I think it's just that it, having school board elected officials on any committee makes the bar a little bit higher than just um, a, a committee of, of staff or community. So. Got it. I wasn't. Um, I would. Uh, yeah. I would love just further expansion for my yeah, own yeah. education. Thank you. I'll, I'll send that. I think when we've talked about this before, what we've talked about is it. We would like. We would like people to be able to participate in our advisory committees, and people lead very busy lives and have very many demands on their schedules. And if we allow electronic participation, perhaps we'll get. Um, we will have more people who are willing to and able to participate who we wouldn't have had before oh right no I totally understand yeah. the desire for it I just thought that we had gotten to a point where you could have at least 25 percent of your attendance virtual um, and I thought that was a, a recent relaxation of the rules up to um, and I wasn't sure that was for individual members so I wasn't sure if the ask was like for the entire committee mm -hmm. to meet virtually on a regular basis or if it was just dropping that 25 so percent I, barrier I, or so I think it's for advisory committees to be able to meet fully, fully electronically. fully electronically so that there could be people to participate. But you're right, for, for school board meetings, there was a change in the last mm -hmm. session that allowed us to, and, right. thought, and committee members. Yeah, right, okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be happy to look at that, try to bring some more clarity to it. <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it, is a, it is a difficult issue because if you look at all the, the conditions for meeting electronic there's a whole lot of them but they're if such then this and and so I'll, I'll see if I can find a good explanation right that would be helpful too because mm -hmm. sometimes we're not usually considered members of the committee we're usually liaisons to the committee so I don't know if that would you know is it the attendance or is it the role as committee member yeah from I, the school board perspective I think it's sort of like you can't meet you can't have more than three of you, two of you together or it's considered a meeting and then you have to, all these conditions that have to be met with public announcements and notifications and things like that so I think that I was think the challenge I think that was the challenge that we were um, trying to resolve several years ago when this came up um, was that because it's a a committee that's of the board that it has to follow the same rules as the board in other words you have to you can't meet with more than two people from the committee you have to advertise those committee meetings and and that if you allow for electronic participation at your meetings that we would allow for the same electronic participation with the, the uh, advisory committee meetings as well um, but but as um, mr. Finneran suggested let us let us go back and see if we can refine that just a little bit thank you Any other comments or questions 
great. Well, thank you. And I believe we're, we're voting on this at our next meeting. Is that the next regular meeting? We'd yeah. like to have it. And that way um, we can get it over to Cindy Mester from yeah. uh, the general government and she'll incorporate it into their uh, legislative package as well. Um, but I know that Mr. Finner is getting ready to um, start making his trek to Richmond on a fairly routine basis and has already reached out to um, our two folks, uh, Marcus Simon and uh, Saddam Salim. So um, thank you very much for, for doing that. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Sure. I, I want to say thank you to everybody for your great suggestions and ideas. And just to leave you, too, with this, you know, this is um, this upcoming session is what I call the uh, kind of like short-term goals here. Um, but the, the long game, uh, really, we'll see, you know, we'll see this JLARC study come back in, I believe, in the summer, uh, whether it be a committee of, of the General Assembly members to take a look at this. They're supposed to convene, review all this, uh, all of the, re the recommendations, and then provide another report for next year. So, you know, what we, what we can do is work on legislators this session to, to really understand more about it and then be prepared next year to hit the ground running with uh, mm -hmm. some really good recommendations as well. So, but thank you for everything. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, 2.02 .02 FY 2025 budget priorities, and I will send it back to Dr. Noonan. All right, thank you, Chair Downs, um, and thank you again, Mr. Finneran. Um, as you all know, uh, at our last regular meeting, we did a presentation um, of our updated enrollment. Um, we had an opportunity to hear from um, not just the uh, Stephen Fuller Institute, but also shared with you some information around the um, Weldon Cooper Center. And that was sort of the kickoff of our, um, you know, we're doing budget all year round, but sort of the kickoff of the budget. Um, we have our upcoming meeting with the um, general government and with the city council members um, on December 4th uh, at the high school, which will be really nice to, to host them. Um, and then in January, I will present the superintendent's budget uh, for your consideration. And this is the time of year when we typically ask you, are there things that um, you would like to make sure that we pay attention to as we start to head into the budget? Um, and traditionally, um, there have been things in terms of priorities around compensation, class size staying small, good social emotional learning support, um, those have been things that for the last several years we've really kind of paid attention to. Um, and so my, my question for you tonight is really, one, given, um, given what we sort of know going into this budget, and I think what we know from at least what's in the newspapers now is that from the state's perspective and based on the conversation tonight, um, the state's perspective, it's probably going to be a tight budget year at the state level. Um, and um, traditionally, um, things have been fairly tight in the city of um, Falls Church as well. Um, so I don't know what the amount of money is that we're going to have to spend, but um, we've had a chance to go out and speak with our principals who have met with their staff, and they've given us their um, sort of priorities. And I, I would love to just hear from you about what your priorities are, and if they're compensation again, they're compensation again. If they're uh, you know, um, keeping class sizes small, keep class sizes small, but um, are there other things that you'd like for us to sort of think about as we're putting our, our final development on um, sort of our budget? So I'll leave it there, and we'll just listen. And yes, Ms. Tice. Uh, I just had a, a couple thoughts. Um, Yes, I'm glad, you know, obviously it's, all, it's so much as a compensation, right? So I, I had uh, two sort of compensation related questions. Uh, one, I just always, I know we went, we did a lot of really great work that I think we all feel good about with the, um, with our pay scales last year and making sure that we were at market rate. I just always want to keep our eye on the lowest end of our um, pay scales and just make sure that we're keeping our eye out for, for anybody who's at the bottom wrong, especially our hourly workers, and make sure that, especially with inflation and all of those pressures, that we're doing everything we can to just keep raising the floor. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, the other one that was sort of related to compensation um, is just looking, I've, we've, heard, we've heard some concerns about the class sizes or the staffing at the secondary level and just making sure we're, I know we've had some challenges being able to anticipate uh, enrollment um, because I understand that there's you know, only, you know, there's a, a difficult way to, there's a difficult way to predict how much um, 
how many kids are going to be in a class and we can't necessarily have two sections of a class just because there's five more kids who want to take it um, and because we're so small we can't just take a point two from another school um, like other districts can but I guess my question is just making sure that we're looking at the um, the class sizes and the staffing levels at the secondary and the implication that summer school has on them I know that that has been a pressure the last few years uh, and making sure that we do whatever we can to anticipate the um, the shift and how many kids are taking summer school and the, the impact that has on the um, the staffing for the regular school year and then my last thought was just on the security on the secondary campus I know we have this big beautiful building that we build as a community space and is being used as a community space which is fabulous but I know that puts a lot of strain on on the staff at the secondary campus or just our school system in general and making sure that we're you know just is there anything else we could or should be doing to relieve that burden and make sure we're keeping our our just not just our campus safe but keeping our our staff there um, feeling supported and empowered that this that the campus is safe great thanks can I um, just respond to one thing and, and I think this will be a conversation that we'll probably have to have as time progresses knowing that we have a fairly tight um, budget probably ahead of us and knowing that we we actually are appropriately staffed at the secondary campus um, but we do have those pressures of larger classes because we are running some classes that are really small um, what some school divisions have done including the one where I was um, as the head of instruction for for a long time was we would um, not unlike college uh, classes it either makes or it doesn't make um, we've we've done a lot to really create a circumstance where every kid who needs what they need gets what they need um, including in some cases co-seeding classes together like um, language three language four language five or language four five and, and IB um, but there are some other classes that are running at 10 11 12 9 and um, if we if we have the support of the board to um, make those hard and fast decisions to save on some of the staffing so that we can keep the other class size sections down um, knowing that going in would be really helpful um, and we don't have to we don't need you to respond to that tonight uh, because that's later down the line but I, I just wanted to put out there that you know it's it's hard when when you start getting bombarded by the eight parents who say they want computer science IB and um, and to be able to step in and say we, we just can't offer it um, but that'll be a, a conversation for us to have to sort of co coalesce around down the line. I think that's a great idea to just have the conversation and be as transparent as possible and just say, you know, we have to make a tough decision. Are we willing to have some classes at 30 plus so that we can have these 10 classes or right. do we need to, you know, and just making sure that that it's out there and the conversation is open. And then I think at least the community knows you know, how the decision was made. That yep. would be really helpful. Fair enough. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you, Chair Downs. Um, I have a few ideas that I've just been thinking about. Um, one, I, I know there was a shift in our, the recess time at the elementary, is it just at Oak Street or Oak Street and Mount Daniel that went from 15 minute lunch to 30 minute lunch? I, I'd need to look into that to okay. make sure. Okay, so I think that they now, from my understanding, they now have 30 minute lunches um, and I think that's to give teachers a full 30 minute lunch break which obviously I believe that we'd probably all support but then um, it's the staffing of the recess at you know for the the 15 minutes which you know I've heard from a lot of parents that 30 minute lunch with a 15 minute recess is kind of lopsided that they'd rather have a shorter lunch with a longer recess and I think that and I don't know but is some of that because of needing to give teachers that 30 minute lunch break so would the solution here to be to hire more recess help um, and, I th and I think I remember that as a budget request last year or the year before was hiring more recess help so if that's a solution to the issue that I'm bringing uh, that I'm bringing up of you know maybe possibly shortening the lunch break a little bit but expanding the recess time and maybe that means hiring more recess help and not requiring all the teachers to be outside for recess it, that just might be something to look at well that is a great budget question number one um, <laughs> because I, I do think it's a complicated um, 
it's a complicated question to sort of unpack. It's not mm -hmm. as easy as you know giving teachers 30 minute duty free lunch or 15 minutes of recess um, because it, we're using some of our daycare staff or using others to cover those recesses along with teachers. So um, how about um, we take that and we put some some meat on that bone and, and see if we can't get an answer to it. I appreciate that. I won't even write that out in an email then for my budget questions. <laughs> I don't think you need to. Um, number two, um, and I, this might be a little bit premature because um, I know for first reading tonight we have the early release, um, early release for first reading, and um, it, if you know things progress, we'll go into a second reading and it possibly might pass or not pass. But in the event that it that the per, that the policy does pass as written, um, I would also like to see if we could price out somehow um, what a daycare system would look like af for after school on Wednesdays that would include um, fully paid for aftercare by the schools along with uh, transportation if we're only going to be offering that aftercare until 3.50 p.m. Okay. So that can get priced out. And then finally, something that I've been thinking about, I guess, for the past couple years and I'm not the expert here. I'm going to leave the educational um, expertise to you. But um, is the East, I, I've just heard comments from many different people within the community about the East, how East Hall is set up at the middle school, um, maybe the high school too. I'm not sure, but I know for sure the middle school by how some of the teachers, uh, you know, the, the primary teacher for a certain subject then also gets their East Hall certification and we're piecing together the ESOL certifications to equal the amount of FTEs that we need. Um, and and I've, I've had people question if that's the right structure. So that then becomes a budget issue if that's something that we reconsider and change the structuring of the ESOL program to include, to have ESOL only instructors um, rather than the basic subject you know, the English teacher also having a 0 0.2 or something. I, I forget what the exact numbers were. We'd be happy to um, sort of talk about that at some point. I, I will just say my, my, instinct, um, my instinct is to, like, begin talking about the value of ESOL teachers, uh, general ed teachers getting their ESOL endorsement um, because we teach ESOL in the content area. And when you have a content expert who's also trained in ESOL, it's like the perfect solution. Um, as opposed to just having an ESOL teacher who's really good with strategies but doesn't know the content. Um, so having that both and, uh, my instinct is to start talking about that for a long period of time and I'll just stop. Um, but uh, I, I would, I would um, you know, we can, we can talk about it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Silverman. Other comments or questions? Yes, Dr. Anderson. There we go. Greenlit. Um, thank you. Uh, so I would like to uh, kind of reiterate uh, my support for um, uh, Ms. Silverman's uh, idea of pricing out a daycare option uh, with uh, with transportation, um, and you know, kind of for you know varying levels of the number of kids just kind of have a have a good broad range of what it might cost for this level of support versus like a slightly higher level of support mm -hmm. um and then related to uh miss silverman's um uh questions on esol I've, I've heard similar things um and uh and i think you know there's you know things to be said on 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 both ways of structuring it um but i also wonder if you know having uh do do our current uh kind of i guess dual certified esol teachers get some sort of bonus for being esol teachers as well as general ed teachers um well the bonus was that they had their um endorsement paid for through mm -hmm. a cohort that they um, volunteered to go through at George Mason. Um, if they had enough, the, the, the coursework I think was five classes, five times three is 15. So those 15 hours could apply towards their service credit in the system. So mm -hmm. if they're a BA plus 15, for example, they go up on the scale. But um, I, I would say as a rule, absolutely not. We want our teachers to to be well versed in instructional best practices regardless of who they're teaching, whether it's an ESOL student, a gifted student, or a general ed student, uh, or a special education student. So having multiple endorsements um, simply makes you a better teacher. Uh, it doesn't, 
it shouldn't differentiate your pay. And that's why I, I actually think the structure that's being put in place, and we actually are starting a new cohort of ESOL with seven new teachers, um, is the gold standard. And having simply standalone ESOL teachers um, is actually, a, 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 in my opinion, a semi-antiquated way of providing ESOL services to our ESOL students. Yeah, I would. Um, I guess I would say that if we are, you know, we, we are obviously paying for training. I mean, I think that's been a benefit for not just ESOL, but for various things. Uh, this is different. This was university credit. They went to George Mason through a, a cohort, took five classes. We paid for that. That's mm -hmm. way beyond just sort of training that we provide. Oh, well, uh, let me, uh, let me, let me, I misspoke. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From what I understand, we have in the past paid for university credits for many things, uh, not just ESOL. Oftentimes um, through grants that we get from Virginia Tech, um, Virginia. Th that being said, uh, if we are getting better teachers, um, and I would imagine that ESOL caseloads are kind of more work than just a kind of general ed, uh, kind of a, a general ed caseload. Um, I would just say that if we're getting better teachers, we should pay, pay, them, pay them more. Um, if you are a better teacher, you should get paid more. Um, but that, that, but when, and when I ask specifically about ESOL, I know that they have an independent caseload of ESOL students mm -hmm. on top of all their other teaching things. And so it seems that they might be doing a lot more, mm -hmm. not, not just in terms of being a better teacher, but the actual work that they're doing. Um, so I think if we're asking teachers to do more, then we should pay them more. That, that's, all, that's all I'm thinking. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. t it sounds a little bit like, and I, I, d I don't want to get it wrong. So, mm, yeah. um, it, it does sound a little bit like there's some merit pay, a suggestion of maybe merit pay, or not, not really. I think you know, we're, better teacher. No, I, I think we're asking. Uh, so we, ha so currently, the way the ESOL system is set up, from what I understand, uh, is that they have a general caseload, uh, or, or a general. They have their general ed classes for you know, kind of the, the usual stuff, and then they have a ESOL caseload in addition to that. Is that correct? I, if I'm a, let's just take a, a, a middle school math teacher. Yeah. Let's say I've got five sections of math, and two of my sections have a small number of ESOL students that are in those two sections. And they've been co-located in there so that they get the best support possible and can um, support them. Yes, that teacher is the teacher of record for mm -hmm. ESOL. Um, and there, there is some additional uh, work that goes with it, but it's not, um, one, it's not an extraordinary amount of work. And two, this teacher specifically went through the training because they wanted to work with ESOL mm -hmm. kids and knew sort of the deal going in, that there would be additional work with it. Um, but the, the advantage, and, and again, it's for the students here, is that, that those students that are co-located in those two sections get the benefit of a content specialist in mathematics who also has training in working specifically with ESOL kids. So if, if you want to um, sort of talk about it, every one of our teachers in some way or another has an ESOL kid or a special education student or a free and reduced lunch student or, 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 or in their classes somewhere. And I, I would... And I know that they may not have the casework for them, but they're asked to come to 504 meetings. They're asked to come to special ed meetings. They're asked to come to ESOL meetings, even though they may not be the teacher of record. So uh, every one of our teachers in one way or another has an extra duty associated with the students that they serve. So I, I, I just am a little bit worried about like separating out, like if you're a special education inclusion teacher, for example, you know, you're going to have, or, or if you're a general ed teacher with special ed kids in your class and you're invited to all of the IEPs because those kids are there, I wouldn't want to pay them more than another general ed teacher that doesn't have special ed kids in their class. Mm -hmm. I, I just think there's a, there's a, there could be some issues there. That's all. Okay. But I, I understand your point. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's why we want to have the very best salary scales in the world, <laughs> sure. or at least in Virginia, because we are putting together a package of, uh, resources for our teachers to get some endorsements that really helps our kids and does make them better ultimately mm -hmm. at what they do. So I, I don't want to mischaracterize and no, I'm, no, no, I'm not yeah. trying to be salty. I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah, no, that's all right. Um, and then I guess, you know, it is, it is going to be uh, a, a tight budget. Um, and I, I think there are probably more uh, budget priorities from the other board members. And I think we also want to ensure that our teachers, um, you know, get paid have the you know, appropriate work conditions you know, kind of all the usual, uh, I would encourage it. But that being said, I would also encourage uh, encourage all to kind of think about, you know, where the 
what, what programs that we have um, that may not be being utilized by uh, you know, a great number of students and finding some cost savings in, in those programs, um, wherever, that, wherever that may come from. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. It's just for trouble. Yeah, I'm trying not to echo the usual. I know, uh, Dr. Nina, you mentioned that, but I'll echo the usual. Um, the, uh, uh, the other, I, I would also echo uh, Ms. Silverman and Dr. Anderson's point about uh, aftercare for, um, uh, for early release Wednesdays. I think that uh, from an equity standpoint, I think that's the argument that we've heard from the community. And I think it would be um, excellent if we have resources dedicated to supporting families to have those uh, slots available for early release Wednesdays and a significant increase than what we provide now. Um, the, I think the, the, the other uh, priority that I would like to um, recommend to the board is a new position, uh, a director of labor relations. Um, I think as, as this board has overwhelmingly supported collective bargaining when we voted for it, uh, we are obviously learning about how this process is un unfolding and the, the FTE and the, the level of effort that's required for us to do this successfully. In conversations with multiple uh, districts uh, in Virginia, um, Chair Downs and I have had, uh, there is a position, usually larger districts have significant more FTE, but I think it would be appropriate for us to have a Director of Labor Relations to support all of our efforts and uh, ensure that we have a positive relationship as we move forward. So I'd like to have a Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. Yes, I think that's that's right on. And um, I'll just add, of, of course, you know, after Mr. Finneran, uh, sort of some of the depressing news we hear about where Virginia falls in terms of funding and, and with the with the rest of the country and teacher pay, of course, we want to, as always, do all that we can uh, to reward our, our teachers um, with benefits and, and salary and, uh, you know, echoing what everyone said tonight, you know, Ms. Tice's point about our lower paid um, you know, part-time workers, um, so really all across the spectrum. Uh, I did want to, I guess, make a plug. Well, as, actually ask you maybe first if you could talk a little bit, and for those who are listening tonight, about um, the assistant principal of student support at the secondary campus. Um, it's my understanding that that was a position that was temporary, and I, I know at our recent um, if you all remember when we were in chambers maybe two months ago when the principals came and gave their school action reports at the end of the secondary um, report, uh, Mr. Pickering and Mr. Laub um, very wholeheartedly requested that this board make that position permanent. And um, so I thought, Dr. Noon, if you could maybe just say a few words about what that position is all about, especially for those who are listening sure. who don't have kids at the secondary campus. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'd also be happy to add into the Friday update um, this week the um, job description for that position so that you can get a chance to see it. Um, this position, obviously, it's Rob Carey. Um, I think everybody knows that. And sometimes positions are uh, important based on who's in them. But this is a position that's slightly different. Um, obviously, Rob is doing a great job, and, and we really appreciate all his work. But coming out of um, COVID, uh, we, we saw a couple of things happening. Um, one was we saw some increase in student behavior um, concerns that were happening, at particularly at the secondary campus, um, that were uh, related to a lot of different things. Um, we also know that in the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, one of the areas of emphasis this year in terms of accreditation is uh, chronic absenteeism. Um, and we're fortunate that we don't have a lot of absenteeism, but we do have some um, across our schools. Um, and then looking at the social emotional learning of all of our kids and thinking about different ways to deal with discipline and attendance was something that we needed to put our heads together uh, about. And, and what we ended up doing was developing this position to sort of attack some of those areas, particularly of emphasis. So um, some of the things that he does, you know, one is serving as the administrative contact for um, all of the attendance concerns, works with the attendance administrators, um, or administrative assistants, um, social work, school social workers, school psychologists, um, uh, to address any kind of truancy or attendance issues. He tracks and monitors the student uh, behavioral data at the school and is able to make some data decisions, driven decisions about um, support for students and the like. Um, does provide reentry communications with school counselors and parents, social workers, if there is an attendance or a behavior issue. Um, really works, and I think this is where uh, Mr. Carey's uh, strength is as an administrator, 
works really hard on interpersonal relationships with the students that um, are sometimes the most challenged and really is in a proactive way working with those students to try to get ahead of some of those behaviors that may, uh, they, that may start to pro crop up. Um, conducts also walkthroughs um, throughout the school to serve as a, you know, just another highly visible adult um, as a person who can be there. Um, but also he participates in the kid talks, which are part of our um, process at the actually all elementary, middle, and high, um, where we pull together um, the most important people in the lives of a kid and begin to talk about what are the needs of this kid and how might we meet those from, a, from multiple domains. One is academic, one is behavioral, one is social emotional. Um, and so he's on those teams. Um, and, and those are sort of some of the general duties. Um, but there are the, the big things that he's done this year that I think are really making a difference. And I, I don't want to land too hard on the truancy, um, but I would land on some of the behavior stuff. Um, we have seen a decrease in student behaviors this year. Um, you know, by this time last year, I think we were all swimming in, in discipline, and I, I can't say that Rob isn't a part of that. It's, it's not causal, but it may be um, some sort of um, correlation of him being there and, and having his fingers on the pulse of what's happening. He's also been trained in restorative practices. Um, so one piece that we're working really hard on this year that perhaps we didn't do as much with coming out of COVID that we wanted to do was sort of the restoration piece after there's an incident in school. So if someone's harmed or the school is harmed or whatever, bringing those kids back in and doing that restorative practice and process um, takes time. And uh, Rob has now been trained along with Sarah Tennyson um, at the middle school to do these kinds of restorative practices with kids. Um, and then he's also working really closely on two other things. And one is um, he is the tier two interventionist. So if a student is struggling in class, he'll also pop into the class and work with students one-on-one -on -one to help them um, as needed. And then lastly, he's the equity lead um, on the campus as well. And, um, and to that end, he's, he's made a, a really great place. Um, he's, he's picking up on this whole Mustang pride piece um, the no place for hate um, work that he's been working through as well um, and uh, and has been serving that campus in that capacity. It's probably more information than he wanted, but uh, he really has made a, already just a difference in terms of the tenor and tone of the campus um, along with the change in leadership, I think, um, and then uh, the volume of discipline and attendance issues has decreased. Um, and we can certainly pull the data around that when we get closer to budget time. The other thing is we also will provide rationale. So if that's a position you'd like for us to consider, we can provide the rationale for why. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I can't remember in any recent time uh, that principals in front of the school board have so openly advocated for a position and two principals, you know, at the middle, middle uh, school and the high school. So that speaks volumes to me. Uh, of course, I've known Mr. Carey since he was a fourth grade teacher at uh, then TJ. Um, so I've known him a long time. I think part of it is, is that it's Rob Carey. But what I particularly love about this position is I feel a lot of times <coughs> school systems are reactive right and and you know you get sort of the why, why I think there's a lot of burden put on us to where were the red flags you know especially you think about terrible things like school shootings and that sort of thing and you know I think there's just this sort of expectation that our schools should be on top of everything and a lot of times schools come at it from a reactive position and what I love about this is it's proactive so this is someone who is really um, getting to know students working with students figuring out what kind of supports they need if it's something that's happening at home you know there's or something that's happening in the schools um, you know what what they can what he can do to support these students and so I just I just think it's it's terrific that we have someone in there um, who is helping students who, and is just a, a friendly person. I know my kids feel very welcome to approach Mr. Carey at any time with any kind of problem. And so it's just, you know, it's one of those things, Dr. Noonan, that, you know, the, the quantitative data, if, if it's there, that's great. But I just think even if, if it's more qualitative in nature, just the whole, um, I guess, vibe that um, he brings to that campus and having a friendly face and someone that, that kids can turn to, I think is just really very important. Um, so anyway, so that, that was something I would like to advocate for um, in, in this budget is making that position permanent. Um, anything else from anyone? 
Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Thanks, uh, Chair Downs. Um, just a couple of things from the perspective of the um, ESOL Advisory Committee. Um, first, we would um, uh, so we support the continued support for the coursework and the co and the supporting of cohorts through the ESOL certifications, as Dr. Noonan described. Um, that is um, a best practice for um, delivery of services, and it's consistent with any other kind of services that we. Um, provide to students in need of the degree to which students are in content classrooms rather than pulled pulled apart is better for them um, and has been shown to be. Um, we'd like to see the parent liaison be a full-time role. Um, the parent liaison um, and the Family Resource Center provides a tremendous amount of support to the ESOL families um, and it's a pretty intense job and one that's hard to do um, it's one hard to do regardless, right? But it's hard to do um, as a part-time role. And then I think one thing we'd encourage, and this is not necessarily a budget discussion, is thinking through the kind of services that are provided and the degree to which those might need to be scaled across the division. Um, what we what we hear um, uh, is that um, you know, like as for, as for example, just getting your kids registered. Right is you know, it's, you know some you know, not the hardest thing in the world to do and you know the um, the the rollout of it I guess the, on, on on the day that school closes actually helps quite a bit in terms of reminding us to do that, but it can be a pretty big challenge especially if you don't know English, um, but there's a lot of little details with respect to signing up for things and doing stuff and getting engaged with the classroom classrooms and other things like that that really just having someone to help and so. Thinking through exactly how all the services are provided, certainly I think it, you know having one person, a whole person helping to do that, but then also just thinking more broadly about all those services and how we make sure they're done is something that would be a useful thing to do. Um, and then in addition, we heard from the counseling team um, as a committee, and um, we'd encourage to the degree it's feasible to ensure that um, a social worker and, count and additional counselors are Spanish speaking. Um, and um, the reason why is it actually just takes take somewhat of a load from the, the one counselor that gets a, a lot of the students at the secondary level, um, but also um, because you know um, you know it, you know being a multilingual learner is not a disability, but um, those students just like anybody else have other needs and being able to make sure we can provide them with those. And, you know, we do, you know, we do provide them with all, you know, we do serve all those needs, but um, it would be a little less of a transaction cost if we were able to do that, you know, directly. So, you know, and those, again, you know, those, that's all, you know, in, in some ways, I know that, that Dr. Noonan would love to be able to do all that. Um, uh, but, um, you know, those are the things that I think are important from the standpoint of, of the advisory committee. Thanks. Sadly, we had a Spanish-speaking social worker a couple of years ago who went on to greener pastures. We tried really hard to keep her, but. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Great feedback. Thank you. Any other comments or suggestions? Okay. Well, this is, as you all know, the beginning of a long process, so we're starting it here. And we'll be meeting uh, with the City Council on the evening of December 4th uh, to talk with them and get some budget guidance from them. So more to come. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for your feedback. We're going to now move on to 2.03, review of easements. And can I go straight over to Ms. Minson? Ms. Minson. Good evening. Thank you. Um, there are two easements in front of the board this evening that I just wanted to share. And thank you, John, for projecting them on the screen. They both are traffic light easements. Two would be with the city. It's on the screen right now on parcel um, C2. This is the area of the economic development site that the school board owns that wraps around um, from Mustang Alley down to Haycock. And so the request is for an easement up at the top where Mustang Alley is, there where a traffic light would be installed, and then midway down Mustang Alley where a second traffic signal would be. I think that might even midway be down midway down Haycock. Um, so. We had a, I had a chance to go over the language in the easement itself with Jeremy Root. He thought that was very straightforward. He just wanted to make sure that the board knew where this e easement was and see if there were any questions about that that I can take back to the team. Assuming this looks good to the board, this would be brought for um, approval and action at the December meeting. Any questions about this plat here that shows this would be the traffic light easement with the city 
after this, there's a second traffic light easement with VDOT. Ms. Michael, I know you're in, very involved with, with all this. Any any comments or feedback on this? No, we're really looking forward to these traffic lights. The one at Mustang Alley and Haycock um, will make a significant difference to transportation um, and our students that are coming in and out of there. And of course, the other stoplight on Haycock, I also think will help slow down traffic as students are crossing. So we're really supportive of both of these. Great, great feedback. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Great, and the second easement is, thank you, John Britt. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Ortiz. I, I just wanted to confirm, um, you know, I, I think also because I don't know how many people are watching, but, you know, folks who have been up there, there are some temporary lights that are installed, and, and this is, a, in, a, a, at least when I was reading this one, I was imagining that this is essentially a more permanent and better timed version of what is currently there. That is correct. Great. The second um, easement would be with um, VDOT. They call their easement something different. It's a deed of gift and donation, but it's it's still an easement, and this would give two traffic lights on Route 7. One would be there at the corner of Haycock Road and Route 7. The other would be um, further down on um, Route 7 near where the exit is for Mustang Alley, where the buses come out. Any questions about this easement or this plat where the easements would, demonstrating where the easements would be? Okay. I think if we have Ms. Michael's seal of approval and, do, oh, I'm sorry, um, Dr. You, uh, Anderson, did you have some questions? Can, can you say a little bit more about where the location is? Is it at where the buses are coming out or where the, the uh, development is? This is, um, this is what would be turning into the development, correct? Yes. I believe the easement on the um, bottom left where it says, um, 2,772 square feet of an easement. Mm -hmm. That is a light that would be going into the economic development site, mm -hmm. but because it crosses through the yeah. kind of portion of land that we own, they would have access to um, install the light, repair it, um, and maintain it. And, and there will <clears throat> not be a light at Mustang Alley and Route 7. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Looks good. Good. And, and we'll be voting on this next meeting. Is that correct? Yes, that'd be okay. great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're at 2.04 transportation FCCPS buses. <laughs> we, uh, so this, this is um, something that was a, a little bit of a, um, I guess, go back. We, we talked a little bit about buses um, when we were considering one time funding. And uh, so this is, I think, more of a big picture sort of. Uh, tutorial on on all things transportation and I'm I'll let you uh, Ms. Michael do or do you want sorry no, go ahead. can I go to Ms. Ms. Michael I'll let you do the honors of, of introducing our transportation uh, guru over here Ms. Anderson yes please <coughs> thank you so much I am super excited um, to introduce Regina Anderson who's our transportation director we were very fortunate that we were able to hire Regina it's been just about a year ago um, so we are just super happy to have Regina here. Um, just as a, a bit of information before Regina starts, um, when we look at transportation, Regina is responsible for all of the transportation operations, right? all the schedules of drivers, the routes, but it's important to note that the maintenance of our bus is done by the general government. So they're our partner in terms of not only maintaining our buses, um, but they also um, get all the fuel and bill us for both the fuel and the maintenance service. So we are very fortunate to have Regina here. Um, it's a small division, but we have some pretty complicated transportation things going on. And I'm just really pleased for everything that she's been able to do since she got here and all of the continued growth that we're going to have. Um, so as you indicated tonight, we had brought forward previously um, some conversations about using one-time funding to purchase buses. So we thought in advance of the proposed budget when we might be bringing forward um, future requests in terms of purchasing buses that would be really helpful for Regina to provide some background to the school board on our current bus fleet. So thanks, thanks Regina. Thank you and good evening uh, Madam Chair and esteemed board members, executive leadership team and guests. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come and share some information with you this evening. Um, I just first of all would like to start talking about what are our buses used for? Well, of course, the main thing our buses are used for is the daily transportation uh, to and from school of our students. Uh, they are first and foremost in 
in our spectrum, that's the most important thing is keeping the main thing the main thing, and that's that transportation. So we start in the morning. We have a bus that transports to the Arlington um, is that Career, Career Center. Center. I keep wanting to call it Community Center, <laughs> Arlington Career Center. Um, and then we start after that with our Jesse Thackeray Preschool. Then we roll into our secondary uh, pickup and drop off, and we end with our elementary school students. Um, after that, the afternoon comes, and we kind of do that same little circuit again, starting with our preschool students, secondary, and then elementary school. And our buses all uh, transport secondary, and they kind of split up to do uh, the elementary schools. But they're all moving pieces. I know a lot of our parents don't know this, um, so I've gotten a lot of calls, so I'm able to share um, and educate a little bit as to what our buses are used for. Um, we do have a limited uh, number of buses that provide the late uh, run buses out of the secondary school, which is really a bonus because a lot of schools no longer provide that service. So that is something we take pride in being able to offer uh, to our students so that they can participate in clubs and other activities in the school, which is very important. Uh, next, we use them for field trips. Our field trips go usually in the middle of the day for our school-aged children. After that, we also provide services for our athletic buses and other clubs. And, you know, if they have the, the bowls and things like that, a chorus, uh, we provide that transportation on the weekends and evenings for those students as well. Uh, so a little bit about our bus fleet. We currently have 23 buses in our fleet. And I know we're small, <laughs> but the same expectation uh, goes for our fleet as any other fleet. We have uh, state and federal guidelines that we have to abide by as well. We have to maintain the same paperwork, the same scrutiny, the same physicals, everything that any other district has to maintain, we do too. So that is a lot of inner working uh, work. So it takes a very creative group of people to keep all those uh, parts going. and. Uh, one thing I always like to mention is we also provide car service for some of our out-of-district students, which is a whole nother spectrum that a lot of people don't realize, and it has a lot of moving pieces to it, too. So we have a very dynamic group of people who keep all those balls uh, in the air, and Kristen is so resourceful in giving us any kind of assistance that we need. Had to put that plug in there. Um, 19 of our buses are used for our daily runs. Uh, 17 of them are diesel, and we love our two electric buses. Uh, they have a lot of benefit, and it's amazing how they're so quiet. That it's just a great thing to get on the bus and drive it, and you don't have to raise your voice. You don't even have to talk in the uh, microphone system. You can just have a normal conversation with your students. So that, that is a great benefit, and no emissions. Uh, four buses we utilize as spare buses. But unfortunately, two of those units um, are not currently being used because they are going to require some extensive repair work. So it is a juggle every morning um, to make sure we have enough buses to cover everything that we need them for. And the weather is getting cold, so we've had a couple of challenges with buses that didn't want to start. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we have to be very creative and be prepared uh, with a plan B for when that happens. So currently, we do have a 12-year cycle um, of lifetime on our buses. And if you look at the chart, you can see that we do have a few of them, four buses that are pretty much at the end of their life cycle. And we have to look at uh, getting rid of those buses, taking them offline, and replacing them with other buses. So as you see on the side, assuming 24 in total with a replacement cycle of 12 years, we, we would like to purchase two buses each year to try to keep that cycle affordable and to keep it you know, at a pace where we can have those buses where, that we can utilize and they're road ready and we're not having to spend a lot on repairs of those older buses because it's hard to find parts once the buses get old. It's very difficult to keep them on the road. Uh, in prior years, uh, we have purchased as many as four buses in a year and sometimes zero. Right. And also we have some growth coming to our district with all this building. 
we do have growth that we're estimating too, which is going to require uh, us to make sure we have enough buses where we can increase um, the amount that we put on the road so we don't have that terrible crowding situation like we had at the beginning of this year that I was told has never happened before, but first time for everything. <laughs> so we've managed to juggle that and get through it. So I appreciate everybody's patience with that whole effort. Um, our athletic trip needs. Uh, athletics typical art athletics here typically have longer trips. They go further distances, uh, which requires uh, the number of buses that we use at one time could vary. It depends on the season, depends on the sports, depends on their schedules, how many home games we have as opposed to away games. So on average, we try to make sure that we have three diesel buses that are ready to utilize for those services with one spare bus in case one of those goes down um, because they're mechanical. Anything can happen to things that are mechanical. So we like to be prepared. So as I said before, the trips are, are longer and there's typically no charging facility at other schools. So therefore, we don't take our electric buses too far down the road because we don't know who is uh, equipped for us to be able to plug in and charge one of our electric buses. And then you're talking about, well, who's going to pay for this? And it gets into a whole nother conversation. So we don't take them too far. We take them to DC. We take them to, into Maryland. Um, but we don't take them any further than that. So now purchase versus lease purchase. So purchase is paying for the full cost of the bus at one time. Uh, this has been the approach that uh, FCCPS has used when purchasing buses using a one-time funding available at the end of the year. Lease purchase is financing the cost of the bus over a period of time. Um, we've used this method for recurring funding and it's historically lease purchased multiple buses at once. So we've done that historically. Mm -hmm. um, the lease period is typically five years, and interest is charged based on the market rate. All right. So this is really mind blowing. Okay, bus purchase costs. FCCPS has a recurring amount of ninety-four thousand five hundred and sixty-seven dollars available to put towards the purchase <laughs> or lease purchase of a bus um, or buses. So if you look at the very bottom, you'll see that one electric bus, the estimated cost is $402,910. And one diesel bus is $147,898. So there's a, a price for everything. I mean, clean air is going to cost. <laughs> so, you know, and it's worth it. <laughs> so um, with that being said, I think I'm at the end of sharing this information. If any of you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. Thank you so much, Ms. Anderson. I've, I've heard so many great things about you. It's well, wonderful you. to have you in person here. And my compliments to you, I know the beginning of the year was a little oh. rocky. You did a great job. And I know that um, from past years, I know that um, you your office feels uh, I guess feedback from the parent community and I know I just want to thank you for your professionalism and your hard work and, and it's really happy to have you here and thank, thank you, you so much for this presentation um, I will say so Ms. Michael the um, that number that's why we usually use that one-time funding at the end of the year because that number is not sufficient right correct and we've had a small amount of money we had buses that we had purchased um, five years ago that ha we finished paying for and that's why this funding is currently available the ninety four thousand five hundred and sixty seven um, but when you look at that amount it it might cover the cost of one lease purchase of an electric bus um, but then that would use up all of that funding for the next five years that would mm. be that payment um, so yes right, we right. Ultimately, we, we would really like to have enough recurring funding to be able to purchase two buses every single year, mm -hmm. right, and not use one-time funding. But since we haven't had sufficient funding, we have been using a significant amount of one-time funding to purchase buses. Okay. And then um, we, so I, I know, um, you know, we, we've sort of, I, I agree, the clean air pieces, you know, but it, it is hard when you're looking at, and you could, because really, so we have the older buses and we have two that aren't working so really we could really use four probably right um 
and to, to replace two of the older ones and then two that aren't working, you know, we, we've seen from the enrollment projections, things are just going to be growing in the school system. And we don't want to be in a situation where all of a sudden we're real, in big trouble that we don't have enough buses. Um, so, I mean, would that be something that, in that, you know, putting the money piece in the electric buses versus diesel, I mean, is, would that be a number that you think would be something to strive for in terms of number of buses? Not, not again, knowing that the electric versus diesel is a different conversation. Well, yes, I, I do believe that the number of buses is something that we really could utilize right now. And it's kind of dire because we can order a bus today, but it'll be a year before that bus is actually rolled out for, from production for us to utilize. So, you know, we're looking ahead and trying to make sure that we have enough to meet the needs of what's coming in the future. And we've also been getting some great support for the general government in terms of providing us with, with data that we can use to look at. Surprisingly enough, it's not always the oldest buses that have the highest maintenance costs. Right, so we need to balance out where are we best spending our money in terms of what buses to replace. And then the other thing that Regina really looks at is we also have to be really thoughtful about, you know, do we have enough buses, for example, that have a wheelchair lift, mm. right? And making sure, and, and that's part of that balancing every day when buses don't work, you know, making sure do we have the right bus on the right route. Um, so we definitely um, need to get rid of the buses that aren't working, that we can't maintain. So I agree replacing those is really critical. And then we do need to be looking ahead um, to ensure that we have enough buses for the increased enrollment growth that we're getting and really that longer term look um, to ensure that we don't get caught behind us. We're waiting for bus delivery. OK, thank you. Yes, Mr. Gould. You mentioned that, that our older buses don't require as much uh, maintenance as some of our, our newer buses. Can you explain that? Because I'm sure some people in the community would be confused, as I am. I'm not using them as. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what is the reason for that? Well, every now and then you will encounter a bus that is like a lemon. I, I'll just put it that way, simply said. It could be a newer model, but it has a lot of defects, a lot of recalls, and it spends more time in a shop being serviced, and the parts are easy to come by because it's a newer model, but we're not using it on the road. And some of the older buses, even though they have the miles on them, they keep on going and they have very little downtime. But once it does have a downtime occur, it's usually going to be down for a while because like I said, in this day and age, it's very difficult to acquire parts for a bus that becomes eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. Um, so there's your balance right there. So that that's pretty much what it is. That makes sense. And then another question I have, and metaphorically, Dr. Noon is going to kick me under the table for this question. Um, what's the thoughts on the radius of pickup? And I know that's not the right term, but um, I know that's been, been thought about, given the fact that we are a small community and, and expanding the radius of pickup. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, is there, what's the trade-offs of that? What's the return, not the return of investment, I know that, but I mean, what's the the benefits of that um, if we increase the ra the radius um, is that what you're talking about yes, increase our walking boundary yes yeah is that has that been discussed or is that thought about or how do we well yeah I, I bring that up often um, that's a way to save money um, because if you increase your walking boundary you're not having to transport as many students so therefore you don't have the need to have to purchase as many buses and have them road ready every day and that's pretty much what it is it do just, we, I'm sorry I didn't go know. ahead no do we have any, like, if you increase it by this, then then quantitatively we would save this? I mean, I know that's a very simple, uh, you know, question and answer, but or could we have that? We could have that? that. I haven't done all the numbers, but we could have that and we could provide that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, I'll probably be, have a budget question. I'll try to work on that question. To okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think, Vice Chair Gold, you'll, you'll find that the, because um, we went through this a couple years ago, um, the parent community gets very involved when you start changing those walk zones. The, I'll just, community? I'm sorry. The parent know. community. Oh, parent yes. Community. Okay. Thank you. You'll be hearing from them. I guarantee you. <laughs> Ms. Silverman. I'm just thinking I'm really happy the only school I live close to is Jesse Thackeray. So <laughs> <laughs> selfishly, <laughs> I will not be one of the parents complaining in, in my own 
personal capacity, but I, I, I understand Dr. Gould's point, but I also understand the parents' need for busing. Um, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Anderson. You've been very helpful personally to my family, um, dealing with different households with different buses. So thank you very much for everything you do. Um, one thing that you mentioned here, you say on average, athletics needs three diesel buses. What's the maximum? That's on average. So what's the maximum number? Is it five, six? Like how many would it be in the... the and, and the busiest night of the year, where we need the most diesel buses for faraway athletics, how many would that be? It has been um, as many as five going out of town at one time, um, depending on what time they're leaving. If they leave anywhere, we try to encourage around 4.30, because then we have more buses available for use. But we have had up to five that have gone out in an evening to do um, sporting activities sometimes taking the cheerleaders or in addition to the JV and varsity team and then you have a whole nother team that goes as well they're going to an away game so they may require two buses so you got three in one and two in the other okay so and so five diesel maximum that we use plus you'd probably want another two to three spares is that right well, yeah, but with the spares, too, the spares we utilize as part of going out of town because we do call in some of our sub drivers. We have people that sub for us on occasion when we are trying to meet a time requirement and our drivers can't, they're doing routes. Mm -hmm. So if the bus wants to leave at 2.30 or 3.30, um, sometimes we're able to get a sub where we don't have to charter a bus. So I make phone calls, and my assistant makes phone calls to try to get those subs to come in. So that's another reason why we like to have um, at least four spare buses on hand, because two of those spare buses may be used to go out of town on those trips. So maybe to clarify, sometimes Regina sometimes. is bringing in sub drivers who are leaving with athletics prior to the elementary runs being complete. So in addition to all the buses that are still being used for elementary, Right, if we have some extra buses, then we can get a sub driver and use another bus while our standard busers are still doing their afternoon dismissal. And that prevents us from hiring charter buses, which is a great savings. Sure, I, so I guess the purpose of my question is to figure out how many diesel buses we need versus how many electric buses we need. In a perfect world, we would have all electric buses minus the, the number that we need for the maximum amount of buses traveling to out of town places, right? That's with money not being a factor. Um, so if they're fi finishing up el elementary runs, that does, in a perfect world, that would not be affected because all those elementary runs would be electric. Mm -hmm. So you really, but so five is the maximum yes. of diesel plus the few spare. Yeah. Okay. So is, is it fair to say having two, essentially two fleets, one would be an out of town fleet and one would be an in town fleet? Thinking about it that way? Sure, but wouldn't, but I would hope that we'd still use some of the diesels for in town because. In case of emergency or a breakdown or. Or, or. I mean, you know, would I guess in that perfect world, yes, we wouldn't use the diesels for in town, but also wouldn't we still use diesels for regular the few that we have for the five seven that we have for regular bus runs, if we need. How many do we use for regular as long bus as runs? As they didn't conflict with having to go out of town. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, as long as it didn't conflict. And yes, you would be using those because our buses do require maintenance and service. So whenever they're coming up to their annuals or their maintenance schedules, they have to be pulled off the road, and usually it requires a day to do an annual on a bus. So you would have to utilize that diesel bus for that time being to replace the um, electric bus okay. when it goes down for their for their uh, annual maintenance. Okay, and, and just for a general statement, I mean, I'm – probably pretty supportive of putting this as a budget item. I don't think it's right to wait for year-end funds, see what we have, and see what we can scrape together each year. And some years we might have the ability to do it, and other years we don't. You are our first line of defense and safety. Um, the buses carry our children to school every day. They should be the safest buses possible mm -hmm. without breaking down. And I think that's an important budget item to finance. Um, so, you know, I... I I can't say for sure, but it, it sounds like a reasonable request. And and so then it just comes down to how many electric versus diesel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Yes, Dr. Dimick. Thank you very much. Um, first, Ms. Anderson, thank you so much for being on the front lines of 
vocal parents, uh, especially at the beginning of the school year. Um, but just to build on what Ms. Silverman um, said, when Chair Downs and I were new to the board, um, Ms. Michael, you very gently, politely um, explained when we were, I remember the first time we were talking about buses, um, how perhaps in the past school boards in Falls Church had, you know, in tight budget years had had to save money and consequently there were years when, when we didn't have this um, sort of maintenance of buses where we don't have all the buses aging out at the same time and needing to be replaced at the same time. Um, so I, I guess uh, since I'm leaving the board, I guess I share that with my colleagues to make sure that even if it's a tight year, we are, we don't try to save money here year after year and then run into trouble. And I guess my, my question is, have we, have we now, has it been enough years now that we've moved past the years wherever they were where we, to save money, didn't do our due diligence with buses? I would say we've made good strides, but if we, I have the remote, if we look at um, the buses here, we do have this one period of time where we purchased four buses that were all the same year, and we did that twice. And both of those, I think, you know, are of course more difficult because they'll all be aging at the same time, right? So I, I, I do think we have some challenges in front of us, but if we continue to regularly purchase them, I do think we can smooth this and make it a much easier process moving forward. Can I tack onto that? I, I know we're talking about buses, but transportation, <coughs> same with our cars and minivans and stuff? The school board has been super um, generous in that a few years ago we did put funding in the budget to purchase a new vehicle each year. And we had been kind of um, taking turns between vans that we're using to transport students and then trucks that we were using for facilities and maintenance and other things. But based on the needs to transport students in vans, um, we have not been consistent in switching every other year. So we've been buying more vans for students and I think We've only purchased one truck in terms of facilities. So we are fortunate in that we do have some recurring money to try to buy a van each year. Thank you, Dr. Dent. Ms. Silverman, did you have something? OK. Um, I, I, oh, yes, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Great last name. <laughs> um, uh, given that you said that it takes about a year for things to roll off the line um, and that we have aging buses uh, that need to just kind of go away. Um, <laughs> does, does this need to be quicker than waiting for the April or May timeline for the budget? Um, that would be preferable by me, <laughs> looking at what we have and what we're working with. And it's due to a shortage of chassis right now, and all the buses require a chassis. So that's why all of a sudden things have come to kind of a halt. Uh, so if you want to have a bus in a respectable amount of time, I've been told by a lot of our dealers it's going to be a year, regardless as to if it's electric or if it's diesel. So, so, so Ms. Michael, we had, you know, we had tabled this, we had the one-time money and we tabled that um, because not everyone on the board felt comfortable approving that expenditure. So we still have that one-time money so, being held, right? Yes, that is correct. We still have that one-time funding available. Um, and when the superintendent presents the proposed budget um, included in there will be some recommendations in terms of spending one-time money, I believe. <laughs> it, it will be. The question is, do we want to do something? Before, yeah, that's what I was gonna before the January. You know, I would look to head head nods from the board, but I'm wondering if we pull that out, and because it was it was its own you know one time expense, and so I would hate for it to get no offense to your budget, but get you know in the budget and and here we are in you know the spring and we then now Regina doesn't have any buses because we took so long. So I'm wondering if the board would be interested in revisiting this at our next meeting looking for yes miss silverman well, and and please help me re um, recollect what happened was the issue diesel versus electric and how many of each if it's both 
electric, both diesel, one of each? I think that was part of it, um, that some um, people didn't feel, on the board, did not feel comfortable spending $800,000 on two buses. So I think that was part of it. Um, I think part of it was this great presentation, I think, gave, um, you know, everyone a lot more information that they probably needed. Um, yes, Vice Trugal. Is the is the number that we still have for the one-time funding around 800000 Is that what we're looking at? That we're trying to decide? We weren't targeting a specific amount of money. We had come forward and said if we purchase two electric buses, if we take into account the recurring funding we have available of that $94,000, the net cost for those two buses is about $700,000. Um, but then we are also going to receive the reimbursement for the electric bus that we most recent, recently received from DEQ. And once that funding comes in, we will have that one-time funding that we could use, um, which will also help towards this. So we, so just to clarify, just so we don't, we don't have, we do have 800,000 in one-time funding. I think logically we would assume that we have that money and we need to spend it, but you're saying that's not the case? We do have more than $800,000 available in one-time funding, right, when you look at the funding that we're going to receive from DEQ and our remaining right. fund balance available. Okay, okay. I, so didn't, I didn't want to imply we only had 800000 sorry. Okay, so there's a, and that, that DEQ funding is for an electric bus? It is the reimbursement for an electric bus, but since we've already made that expenditure, we're going to receive that revenue and we've made the expenditure in a prior fiscal year. Okay. If I, so if basically, I can, just, that funding sorry. goes to ending balance. Yeah. Uh, just to, to clarify, and I, I think um, Ms. Anderson said this, or, or Ms. Michael did, sort of back to um, Ms. Silverman's point, because we would be spending the dollars from our year end on this and not being tied to the DEQ funds, with the DEQ funds, you're required to take one of the diesels off the road. We would not be required to take any diesels off the road. So if we bought two electrics, we would have then two additional diesels that could be available to us for some of those longer runs. And so, so we'd, be, we'd be actually adding to our fleet as opposed to a one in, one out kind of circumstance. And I think that that helps us um, in some ways with having some extra, extra buses in our fleet. So if, if we were to approve the one-time funding um, next meeting, we could get that order in you could use those two electric buses to pull off the two that aren't working i would assume that would be probably the way we, or i would leave that to you obviously no, no, correct <laughs> but, and the other thing is and we are still waiting for the bus from the don buyer federal grant mm -hmm. um that was ordered a very very long time ago yeah, um which is expected to be here march but it was ordered like last march yeah okay would the yes dr anderson uh dr Newton, could you just kind of repeat what you just said sure sorry so um when we purchased the first two buses um electric buses that we got we got some federal money to help us offset the costs of those and that was called a deq grant um, one of the requirements of the grant was that when we bought the electric bus we had to disc discard a diesel bus because we wouldn't be using DEQ funds to purchase the next two electric, but instead using local funds that are uh, additional um, year-end balance funds that we have, we wouldn't have that same requirement. So in other words, we could then add two buses to our fleet without taking two out, like we were, were required to with the DEQ funding. So the two that aren't running, you know, if we were to get them running, we could still use those as well as the two new electric buses. So essentially it's an additive as opposed to uh, just a, an even swap. Does that make sense? Maybe not. So have we not gotten rid of the diesel buses that we replaced with the electric buses? Yes, we have. Yes. Oh, no. Okay. We, they, we took they took those? Uh, okay. So, so, the so, minute the yeah. other ones came. Yeah, so, but, so, but these we wouldn't. Yeah, so, our, so this wouldn't, right. so any, any buses that we buy right now has no, no bearing on the how many buses bus. we keep, whether yeah. it's diesel or electric. Correct. Right. That's correct. So basically we'd be expanding our fleet by two. That's right. We'd be expanding our fleet by two. We still have two buses that aren't running, but if we were to get if those we running, could get we'd them have up two and additional running. buses that would be running. 
And, and that's, you know, I, I will say that I've said this many times, but I, that is, I said it earlier this evening, but that is one of my concerns is just, you know, looking at those enrollment projections, if those really hold true. Um, and it's not easy to get a bus, you know, it, at the, oh my gosh, we don't have enough buses. Like, where, where are we going to find a bus? You know, so I think it is one of those things that we just, um, you know, to expand the fleet by two would be terrific, even though we, in keeping those two that are kind of lemons, at least we would have them and could keep working on them. So um, would the board feel um, supportive of putting this on um, as a budget item for our next meeting? Yes, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not trying to rush you by any means. Um, can you uh, just kind of detail our experience with the two electric buses so far? Okay, so far our two electric buses, um, bus 20 has been awesome. Um, very rarely ever down for any issue. Uh, bus 21 has had some issues, and, and some of it is user error because we're learning um, about these electric buses so sometimes it's as simple as we didn't like we had this extended weekend and if we forgot to shut off the battery you would come back to a dead bus which would require you to have to tow that bus to the dealership for them to get it enough charge and get it back in, a, in line in the communication because it downloads information into the buses, but if the battery's dead, the bus didn't get that upgrade or that download. So we've learned. Um, bus 21, unfortunately, was like the victim of some of those um, miscommunications. So I think bus uh, 21, I'm sorry, bus 21 has gone down probably about three times uh, for different issues. And I think two of those times were probably user error, uh, but we're under warranty, so that is the good thing. So the tow is free. and and they take care of it for us while we learn. Um, but other than that, I think they've been up, they've been running, they've been great. The kids absolutely love it. Um, some of them want to be on that bus all the time. Some of them try to get permission to ride that bus. <laughs> so it's, it's a really good thing. And I think uh, looking overall with all it being a new product, and of course the first year you're getting the kinks out. So I think it they are very uh, good additions to our squad and the drivers love driving them who have them currently so i think they're good additions so how about we do this how about i will um talk with you all offline and see who if you have more questions and if everyone feels like their questions have been answered and um we could put it on the agenda for for next um meeting so my only thought is, again, the um, time is of the essence. And so, um, you know, and we've got two new board members coming on and all that. So I just, you know, if, if we could wrap it up, I think that would be a f fantastic show of support um, for our operations staff. But I don't want to rush people if they're not ready for that um, decision. So we'll, I'll talk with you all offline, and we'll decide if we're, we're ready for that for next meeting. But thank you again so much for it was really informative and Ms. Anderson, thank you. This is I often say like operations is unsung heroes and you really are one of our heroes. So thank you for getting all of our kids safely to school. I know it's a lot of work. Thank you so much. And we'll, we, you got to go because those buses are going to be ro rolling out. <laughs> thank you again, Ms. Anderson. OK, uh, so we are going to now move on to um, uh, item 2.05, the draft of the 2025-2026 school calendar. And Dr. Noonan, I'll shoot it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, as I set this up and, and we bring up the calendar. Um, oh, yes, please. Um, we, we'd like to first thank the board again for passing a calendar policy. Um, when you did, it certainly made this work uh, a lot more straightforward and um, quite easy. Um, to do. So some might ask, well, why are we adopting a school calendar? Um, I thought we did a two-year school calendar. And the answer to that question is, yes, we did do a two-year school calendar, but we promised that we would keep a two-year out rolling calendar. Um, so what we are looking at um, presenting to you for the first time is the FCCPS 2526 calendar. Um, some of the uh, rules of engagement, if you will, that were um, in the 
um, school calendar policy that you passed that we wanted to pay particular attention to, not what well, we paid attention to all of them, obviously, um, was one, um, that we wouldn't start school any earlier or any later than two weeks prior to, um, uh, to Labor Day. So that's a, a standard uh, two week prior to Labor Day start um, that we would try to end uh, by the first week in June. Um, and that uh, we would look to give a two-week winter break uh, whenever possible. Um, so what we have for you is, is something that looks quite similar to what we have this year, actually, um, and it feels like a really good, uh, really good fit. So let me orient you to sort of what you're looking at um, because you'll see a couple of different colors in here. The first are the pink blocks, and the pink blocks are the holidays that are um, that are recognized by the school system. So you'll see in there, for example, in, um, in September we have Labor Day, in October we have uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and Columbus Day, uh, in November we have Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, um, Christmas, which is a federal holiday on December 25th, then in January, New Year's Day, Martin Luther King Day, uh, February President's Day, then we have the long flat bottom of March uh, and April, um, at sort of the doldrums of the, the vacation time. Uh, and then in May, we have Memorial Day. So those, to just orient you first, are, are the holidays that we've put into there, uh, into the calendar. The yellow days that you see are those four holidays that were very specifically called out in your policy of Yom Kippur, um, Rosh Hashanah, Eid, and Diwali. So you'll see in September um, the 23rd, um, Rosh Hashanah begins its, uh, at sunset on the 22nd and runs to the 24th. Um, Yom Kippur runs sunset of uh, October 1st, uh, and then Diwali is uh, the 20th of October. And then in March, we have Eid al Fitur, uh, which begins at sunset on the 19th. Um, those days, um, like we started this year, are in some ways protected, uh, insofar as we're asking for teachers not to uh, do any testing, um, not to do any, anything high stakes. Um, that would potentially um, impact those students that are out uh, for those holidays. Then as you look at the letters, so those are the big picture color things, um, you'll see if you look in August, um, NT, which is new teacher orientation, would begin on August 4th. They would have three days of new teacher orientation, the 4th, the 5th, the 6th. Then um, all staff would be back on the 7th for teacher work days. We would have teacher work days August 7th, 8th, and then we have professional development for our staff on the 11th, 12th, 13th, and then two teacher work days, the 14th and 15th, with the start of school beginning on the 18th of August. Um, we have to give, and it's not in red, but we do have to give the August 29th date as a holiday, and that is required by the Code of Virginia in exchange for uh, being able to start prior to Labor Day, you have to give a four-day weekend for Labor Day. Um, and so the way that we do it is the Friday off before and the Monday of the holiday. Um, looking into October, you'll see um, EQ, which means end of quarter. Um, so the 22nd of October is the end of the quarter. And then we have uh, two teacher work days that fall on the 23rd and 24th, and those also are conference days. Uh, for, for our teachers. We roll into the second quarter. The second quarter ends on January uh, 15th, and we have a teacher workday that follows that directly uh, on the 16th. Um, we go forward into March. March 26th is the end of the quarter. Uh, we have a teacher workday on the 27th, and then we have spring break beginning March 30th to uh, April 3rd. So one might ask, well, where is the other, where is the Easter holiday? Because our spring break is typically backed up to Easter holiday. Um, we obviously um, have made a decision to put our, um, our spring break where it makes the most sense relative to where the quarter ends. And the quarter ends on the uh, 26th, as I mentioned, of March. Uh, we have spring break, and then the Easter holiday happens to be on the 5th of April. Um, so it does back up to that Easter holiday. Um, and that was just based on the number of days in each quarter. So if you look at the bottom, there's also a key that says the first quarter is 45 days, second quarter is 45 days, third quarter is 47 days, and the fourth quarter is 43. 
And the reason that there's sometimes some variance in that is to make sure that it ends as close to the end of the week as, a poss as possible. Um, but a range of anywhere from five, uh, well, a range from zero to five to seven days is not unusual in terms of putting together quarters. And teachers can plan for that effectively as well when they know in advance. And then um, we move forward and the uh, end of the year um, would be the end of the fourth quarter and that is Friday, uh, June 6th with the teacher work day on Monday the 8th and then graduation backing into May would back up like it will this year to the Memorial Day holiday which is on Tuesday, May 26th um, and that will also be a teacher work day and the nice thing about that is it does give our teachers and our staff that want to attend graduation the opportunity to attend graduation and they can also help us um, do some of the graduation things that we uh, have to do. So um, we really feel like, um, well, first, first of all, we really feel like you passing a policy and helping guide us in terms of the development of the calendar has been extremely helpful. Um, this calendar um, took less than a day to put together. There wasn't extraordinary numbers of hours of vetting. Um, and in the end, we have exactly what I think the school board was trying to achieve with respect to the start date, the end date, the two weeks at the, at the winter break, um, and then um, uh, all of the other teacher work days woven in there as well. So we share this with you uh, for your information tonight. Um, and we would love for you to ask any questions that you have of us, give us feedback, but we would like to um, ask for the adoption of this calendar at the December meeting. Um, because it's so straightforward and there's no, <laughs> there's really not a, the other, the other working uh, piece that we put into this is it has to have 180 days. And so if we add days or take days away, um, that, that would be the only <coughs> modification, but by and large it, it works really well. So with that, we welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Newton. And I, I will say that, uh, you know, part of that calendar policy, I think we were all in agreement that we didn't necessarily have any um, desire to anchor spring break with Easter. It happened, as you said, it happens to fall um, with the quarters. But the other piece was we did acknowledge that there had to be some alignment with surrounding systems because the majority of our teachers with their own kids live in, do not live in Falls Church City. And that was a big problem a couple years ago when we did not line up with Fairfax. So. Uh, any to be clear, they didn't line up with us. That's, <laughs> thank you. They, thank you. They, or we're, any of the other surrounding Yes, you're right. They were the outlier. Yeah, yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, any, yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you for putting this together. Hopefully um, it was easier than in, in, in other years. Um, one question I have, um, Diwali, I was just double checking the dates just to make sure everything lined up correctly. Is that October 20th or 21st, according to my phone calendar, it says 21st, yeah. but I will go with whatever... You Those, say. Uh, right now we have them on the 20th. We, um, we will make any adjustments because it's connected to um, the, um, not the lunar year, I'm trying to remember exactly what the right language is, um, but it does change from year to year. So we will make sure that um, as we approach it, if there's any, any change, we'll let you know. But right now we have it as the 20th. Okay, sounds good, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Ms. Herman. Yes, Mr. Gould. Um, and this is outside the policy, so defer to you all on this, but the end of quarter, since we've moved the start date up in August, um, is there any chance of having the end of quarter before the holiday break? Um, or, and I look, it looks like there's too many days anyway to do that, but um, has that ever been discussed or thought of from the school site? Of course, we've, we've thought about it. Ideally, we'd love to end before the holiday break, um, but it does extend 10 days beyond. Um, and so to try to keep that 45 to 47 day range, um, we, we really felt like it needed to go there. If we wanted to shorten the second quarter to 35 days, you know, then you've got another, the next quarter's 50 um, or more. And it's just, I think to keep that balance, it wouldn't be a great, a great idea. Okay. Um, I do know I've worked in systems that had that, um, but we started around o August 10th or, or 12th. Okay. I'm sure our <coughs> student rep, Sean, loves to study over the holiday break, so <laughs> I don't want to take that away from him. <laughs> but I also know the high schoolers think that third quarter already feels like it's five years, so I don't know if it makes yeah. the third quarter any longer. Yes, Ms. Heiss. I uh, was just curious, not that I'm opposed to it for any reason, but the only... Um, what was it, March 
4th was already listed as the early release professional development. I just was curious oh. if there was reasoning for that on there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the joint Wednesday um, that we currently have. We didn't mark all of them. It's sort of a relic, I think, um, that's there. Got it. So when, when the decision is made, whatever the decision is made about early release, release Wednesdays, we'll also mark those in the calendar. So that will be really clear. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so uh, I guess it, it, I'll assume from no other questions or comments that this calendar is good to be voted on at our next meeting. So if, if you have any kind of issues or whatever, please get in touch with Dr. Noonan and uh, copy Vice Chair Gould and myself. But if we don't hear from him, we'll assume this is in good shape to vote on at our next meeting. Okay. Kind of makes sense to do it with the early release Wednesdays also, because then we can develop the whole material mm -hmm. set that would go out to the community. Um, at the same time, looking at the 12, 24, 25, and 25, 26. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, speaking of early release, uh, our next uh, item is, th our next agenda item is three point, and Ms. Michael, I'm sorry, I didn't even thank you for, because I know you were very. Uh, oh, <laughs> to be clear, she did all I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, right. that was a big, big miss on my part, so no, thank no, you, thank you, Ms. Michael, for, for that. Uh, so we're at 3.01, first reading of policies, and uh so as the public knows, since the spring, we've been talking about uh, looking at starting the secondary campus later. And also, we wanted to look at early release Wednesdays. And we've held um, at least 10 town halls between uh, with the staff at all the different schools, parents, our student community, and our ESOL community. Uh, we've heard from uh, well, we have, we've got, received some emails, um, not a lot, but we have received some emails. Um, most of the, thing, the feedback we've received were f from our town halls. And um, so based on that, uh, we had, we've had several public discussions uh, in the spring and also this fall. In our last uh, meeting, we, um, it, it was uh, from the majority of the board indicated that they did want to put these decisions in policy. And you know, one of these, one of the, um, I guess, tough parts of the, both of these is that um, you know this is I feel like one of those classic uh, issues before us that um, we're not going to be able to make everyone happy, and I think that's the biggest challenge of being on the school board is that as much as you want to try to make everyone happy, it's it's hard to, and so I think this is a perfect example of that we all. Um, you know, want to represent um, different segments of the community and do what we think is, is best. I know some some of us went into this thinking we would come out of it this way, and I think after those town halls, our minds were changed in different ways. So um, I do appreciate everyone keeping an open mind and listening to um, our teachers, our parents, our students, our ESOL community. And, um, but in the end, as I said, the majority of the board did want to um, put this, these decisions into policy because we had spent so much time listening to the community. Um, I don't anticipate that, and um, not to um, be Debbie Downer, I don't think we may not have unanimous votes on these um, because, as I said, I think, I think our board uh, members are looking, approaching this differently. Um, but what I did want to do is have, we do have a first reading for these policies um, in front of you this evening. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm playing the role of Ms. Minton on this, but um, I'll go ahead and, and get us started um, with policy CD. And these are secondary school start times. And so um, this is, a, this is um, a little bit more straightforward than the early release one. Um, Dr. Uh, Gould suggested the the first line, which I thought was a nice way to start this policy, explaining why we are um, looking to change the start time and the end time. Any comments on this policy? Yes, Ms. Silverman. I have a question for Dr. Noonan. Um, what time? How I, I, this is? Uh, let me think of how to phrase this. How much time is needed? Um, f like. Um, at the end of the bus run for secondary in order to then do the elementary bus run? Because I know that the policy as written 
would postpone the start time of the elementary school. So how much time, and I, I wish Ms. Anderson, I guess I should have presented that question I, to her too. I actually think Ms. Michael knows the answer. Oh, we've thank done, you. We've done a lot of analysis on this. And it's something we had a really long conversation about. So, <clears throat> you know, right now we're dropping off high school students at 8.05 in the morning, and then they do their elementary run, and the goal is really to get elementary kids to school about 8.40, so about 10 minutes before their start time. Right, so the concern was if we move the high school or secondary start time to 8.30, that between 8.30 and 8.40, th there's just not enough time, right? So in order to not move the school start time to 8.30, but then still drop secondary students off from transportation at like 8.10 or 8.15, right, we felt that we needed to move the elementary time. Otherwise, we're kind of defeating why we're moving the start time later for still dropping students off on the bus earlier so we really do feel like like we need a solid like 20 minutes between when we're dropping off the secondary kids and when we plan to be dropping off the elementary kids and and that's probably pretty tight but our goal was to maximize the impact of starting secondary later in terms of giving students the most sleep and having a minimal impact on elementary while maintaining our 2232 agreement with Fairfax about the start times for Mount Daniel. So an 820 start time would not affect the start time, the, the, an 820 start time of the, at the secondary would not affect the elementary start time. I do think if we moved it to 820, right, still us dropping kids off there, you know, like 10 minutes at least before that would not impact elementary. Okay, I also just want to um, inform the board and, and everybody listening. I did speak with um, Mr. Schlitt today over at the community center and just wanted to hear his feedback on the extra 10 minutes at the end of the day. And, you know, his response, and, and he said I could speak th about this publicly, was, you know, it, it's not the end of the world, that extra 10 minutes, but it still does bump everything back you know 10 or 15 minutes later for everything that occurs so you know a game that ends at 10 p.m. Um, you know across multiple locations would then end after 10 p.m. so he, he said there would still be a ripple effect happening at the Parks and Recreation Center something to consider so I just wanted to say as we are discussing these policies that I would very much be in favor of an 820 to 3 p.m. Day at the secondary campus. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Any other comments? Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Um, first, I'd like to say that I support um, Ms. Silverman's uh, proposal. Um, my feeling on the on you know acknowledging the the, the literature and the you know and the and the, and what and um, and the um, and the evidence regarding the start time it's not just you know when students get to school but it's when they're actually uh, awake right um, <coughs> that it's uh, you know that 830 is 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 kind of the, the you know, what's been recommended um, I think that the the postponing of the of the elementary schools you know it's like it ends up being a, uh, another additional burden on elementary families, and I'm, I don't think I'd be, I'm willing to support that. Um, so I'd be in support of, 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 of Ms. Silverman's proposal. Um, but I think I do have actually an improvement to the policy if you were to adopt it. Right now, what, the way it's worded is to actually constrain the, the time of day, basically saying you can't start before this time and end after this time. I'd probably suggest that you kind of leave it, that you actually change the end time to say, shall not end um, earlier than 310 um, so that you're kind of allowing for a longer day if that's something that's necessary or, or, or anything like that. So, like, I mean, I think it's just like rather than constraining it this way, it's pushing it both that way, if, if you get the point. So that's just a suggestion there. Um, obviously, it allows for it to end at that time as been, has been proposed, but um, it seems to me a little bit incongruous for us to just to, to be – not just changing the start times, but constraining the amount of time that students are in school. That seemed to be like contrary to what the goals were here in the first place. Understanding, of course, that that's kind of what's being done for transportation and other things. It, it is it's, it's a, a little bit against, I think, what the intent was in the first place. Yeah, I, I think the reasoning for that was that um, 
there was would not be support if um, if the school if the school day last went beyond three ten. Then I think there would not be support from uh, large segments of the community because of all the issues with athletics and all that. So I think that is why it's worded that b way. Yeah, but. No, I appreciate that, but I'm totally not in favor of us intentionally constraining the school day. Um, so that's another piece that we're doing here that I that I don't agree with. I mean, I wouldn't agree with that if that's the way the wording was for the 820 time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Vice Chair Golden and Dr. Demick, go ahead. Oh. No, go ahead. That's okay, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Neum, for you, is from a policy perspective, having an end time listed at all, whether it's before or later, is that What's your views on, from a school board's perspective, adding an end time versus the start time? I'm always a proponent of flexibility. So anytime we can build flexibility into a policy, we try to we try to do we try to do that with um, legislation. When we talk with Patrick Finneran and some other things, so I think um, you know if if we say that we're going to end at three ten. Um, we're going to end at 310, but if you change the language to say the final period will not end earlier than 310, we still could put a, a time schedule out that shows us ending at 310. It just, in, in further down the line, if something changes drastically and we have to add more classes, I don't know, it just opens up an opportunity for us. So it just provides a little, an extra level of flexibility, but I, I don't want to risk the policy not passing either um, or, or losing support but I I'm always a proponent of flexibility I guess is my point I guess the question then is do we need an end time list at all and I don't know if this is a, a Miss Minson question or not but what was the advantage do you recall of why we would have an end time listed uh, versus can, just the start time can I add on to this is as it's written is it gonna conflict with early releases at the at the secondary because we it might I, and sort of, I, I the think way it's written, it's problematic for an early release. I think what you're driving at might be sort of the best of all solutions. Potentially, would be just to say, set, set, you know, aligned with the national recommendations from the organizational health. Um, I know I didn't say that right. The first period of the day at the secondary campus will not begin prior to 8:30 a.m. Just leave it at that, and we we will build a schedule that will end at 3:10. Uh, yes. Except on early release days. <laughs> right. Yes, Ms. Tice? Uh, I, I certainly agree with that in, in theory. I'm not opposed to that wording, except that I do think that the advantage of having listed the start time, I mean, the end time also reflects so much of the community feedback we heard about the concerns about the day going later. Um, but I think the whole reason we, I think a large part of the community now supports this because of mm -hmm. that safety of the 310. Okay. Um, we heard so um, so much concern about going past 310 that I, I do worry leaving it so open-ended that, you know, a few years from now that could get lost um, if the people on the board weren't engaged in that community feedback when it happened. Um, I mean, obviously policies can be amended whenever. Um, and I, I love in general supporting um, the superintendent's flexibility. So um, I do worry that this might not be the place for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Demick. But it could also be that three years from now we're in a different athletic league and we don't have to leave so darn early to get to all of our games. So I, I guess I'm okay with some flexibility there. Um, being mindful that the board at any time can say to, if the superintendent oversteps the 310 that the community wanted, can then tell their one employee how they feel about it. <laughs> Any other thoughts about the, um, I, I guess, okay, so I guess, what if, yeah, what if, what if you added some language that was maybe more pointed to um, the community that you're particular, particularly trying to protect with the 310? What if, what if it was the secondary campus will not begin prior to 830 and will be respectful of after school activities, programs, et cetera? Uh, to ensure a start time is consistent. I, I don't know what the right language is, but start time will not, or end time will not interfere with after school activities. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe that's a bad idea. I'm just spitballing here. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Uh, I would just say we keep it at 310, because um, as it's written, it says will not end later than 310. I don't think that gets in the way of any kind of early release, because then it would be, if it were to end uh, no earlier than 310, that would be the issue. Um, 
And right now, like uh, the community that we were, uh, that we heard from were all the after school activities. And this is how we have put that into action. And I don't, I don't see any reason to, uh, to kind of, I mean, this is a very clear policy. Mm -hmm. If so, if they need to come back and amend it, you know, some future time, that's fine. Um, but, um, and it's not just like the athletic league that we're in and then traveling to it. It's also just the practices at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. whether or not we are in a different league, those practices are going, going to be going on at the end of the day. Um, and so just, I think 310 is a, a fine a fine thing to have in there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Anderson and Ms. Tyson. I do think that many minds cha were changed when when – Dr. Noonan came back with the we could we could end at 310. So I think I think you're right in that and, and Ms. Tice too that we we probably wouldn't have gotten here if it wasn't a 310 end. Um, so um, I guess so. Let's go. Let's take a step back. Um, Ms. Silverman and Dr. Ortiz have proposed 820. Um, how does the board feel about that? Do, 820 or 830? What are the thoughts on that? Yes, Vice Chair Gold. Um, I am strongly opposed to having any time uh, earlier than 8.30 based on both the national recommendations as well as the amount of work that we did um, as well as the research that strongly supports an 8.30 time. I fully understand that we are trying to understand and respect the logistics of the elementary community um, and clearly that will impact and I think when we started this process we talked about uh, a policy that is really about students and what's best for students especially their social emotional well-being the research is clear that an 8:30 start time ideally and minimal is is uh clearly beneficial for our secondary community there isn't research that supports the benefits of having elementary start it is much more of a logistical which is a highly respectable problem that we're trying to face but the research is clear that secondary students need more sleep i also applaud miss michael on trying to um respect the 8.30 time to get the kids there um, and, and not trying to, uh, you know, still have the kids picked up at the same time so the bus and the operational issues are, are worked out. I know that's a challenge. But again, I think we've got to, if we're going to support this policy, and I fully respect my colleagues that, aren't, that might not respect, um, fulfill this policy, but I'm strongly in favor of 8.30 um, and not moving into 8.20. Otherwise, I don't know why we just went through so many months of work and talking with students and faculty and everyone else. Yeah, and just my perspective, I do feel that, you know, 830 is the gold standard and we went through a lot. And so um, I feel like we need to get it over the finish line that I, I would be disappointed if we, um, and, and I, I agree to uh, Vice Chair Gould that it's, it is, um, you know, 10 minutes la later for the elementary um, students i just hope that those families can appreciate that we're doing this for their kids when they get to secondary you know so it, it is a little bit of a burden having a 10 minute later start but it's for their own students so when they get to the secondary campus and they become come tweens and teens and they'll have that extra half hour of sleep um i think they will maybe hopefully look back and, and thank us so um so i think so that's um and ms tysa you wanted to keep it at the 8 30 and then Dr. Anderson and Dr. Dimmick. Okay, so so that so we would keep it eight thirty. Um, so where are we on the three ten? Having that specific, I, I personally would like to have it as worded um, in the policy. Um, Vice Chair Gould, what do you think? I, I agree with Ms. Tice's point. So yeah. Okay, and Ms. Tice and Dr. Anderson, Dr. Dimmick, are you okay with that? Okay, okay. So it looks like, um, and again, I know that's. Um, so I guess we have to actually. Let's see. Ms. Minson, do you think we'd then, let's see, sorry. I'm not used to be me, being Ms. Minson, hold on. Um, so, okay, so we'll discuss the other one and then we, we make the motion, right? Okay. That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, so it seems that, that the majority of the board is um, okay with as, as it is written now. Um, so we'll move on to um, early, policy CE, early release Wednesdays. Um, that policy is in front of you. And so the feedback that um, we received, that Vice Chair Gould and I received, was um, the original policy that was um, sent to you all had some language in there about, um, you know, we didn't hear um, 
I think there was some support um, from the administration of the secondary schools to maybe have another day or two of early release. Um, we didn't hear it hugely from from the secondary community, um, but I know that um, uh, the the principals and ministers did say they would they would appreciate a little bit of flexibility um, in to have to add you know a day or two to for professional development. And um, so the original version that you all saw talked about uh, the superintendent ha having the secondary campus would have maybe approximately two or three extra days and there would be some notice a couple months out. And so the what I heard from um, several members of the board is that uh, there were some concerns of having it be sort of, for lack of a better, loosey-goosey, for lack of a better term, and wanting it to be more um, really in line with how we publish early release Wednesdays now. So um, you, you all remember that sort of list format um, of the calendar. There's the grid one we looked at tonight, but then there's also a list one that Ms. Michael does with the early release Wednesdays at the bottom. And so the idea would be that if secondary were to add a day or two, you know, in March or April, um, that that would be published in that, on that list format so that parents knew, you know, day one when those extra uh, early release days were gonna be for secondary. So that was one piece. The other piece was, um, do we, how many do we want to uh, suggest? So, so if they were to have one a month, that would be nine. If they were to have 10, I'm mean, sorry, yeah, if they were to have 10, that would give them an extra uh, early release Wednesday. And I think we, the one I always bring up is March because there's not generally, um, generally, you know, it could be April, March and April don't generally have holidays except for spring break. So you would, the one that doesn't have spring break, you would throw that second early release Wednesday in. Um, and part of that too is also, you know, what is, is not, not just for planning, uh, professional development, but also, um, as you all know, I've said this several times that it also gives our students that's that's a long that third quarter when there's not a lot of breaks it gets to be long. So that's also a social emotional piece for our students to have a little bit of a break. But so really, right now, I'm just going to focus on that this piece, the secondary campus piece, and hearing from you all. How do you do? You feel comfortable um, letting secondary have um, another early release day or two? What number would that be? Um, and also, do you feel that you would want those dates indicated, you know, earlier on? So yes, Miss Tice. Uh, yes, I definitely would prefer that the all early releases are just published when we ever we. we pass the calendar so that families have as much notice as possible. Uh, and I like the idea of expanding, giving a f maybe another early release or two um, to the secondary campus. The way it's worded when it says maintain up to, whether it's 10 or 11, it could be zero. Um, oh, okay. So I was thinking maybe we want to do a range, like the secondary campus will have 9 to 11 early release Wednesdays or maybe give a range so that we're ensuring that they get at least one a month. Right, um, that's a good but point. But on, on years where March is super long, you know, they can throw in an extra one, or if there's ever, you know, two, if you could foresee two years ahead, some other reason to add one in throughout the year um, to give a little bit of flexibility. Um, okay. So I'd, I'd probably p propose that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great um, point about the wording there. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Um, I agree with Ms. Tice. I just have a question about sort of, I like the idea of parents knowing what the dates are going to be, but with our two-year calendar, I guess I'm wondering, and I am not the expert on this, so it's it's one, th it, noticing it in December for the following year gives eight months, but if we're then also doing that for the, the year after that, so this year for uh, the 2025, 2026 school year. That's like 20 months out from school year starting. Just from, I don't know, from planning, professional development, and the needs of the school is, is it, like what is professionally better? Is it better to be sort of forced to decide those days 20 months out from the beginning of the school year? Or would eight months out be more effective for planning purposes to know when you need things. I, I, I don't. 
I, yeah, I think it's a really good question, and I think uh, everybody's raising good thoughts about it. I, I understand and, and value um, the, the need for the community to know as far out as possible. Um, I, I will just share with you from my personal experience as a high school principal, for example, and a middle school principal, when I had that flexibility, there were things that came up that were instructional issues that I felt like I needed to deal with in the, not in the moment, but within a, peer, a range of time. And, um, and that half day allowed us to, that flexibility of that half day allowed it. So I know that probably two months or three months notice is off the table. So I, I, would, I would say if we could do it the year upcoming to give maybe eight months is probably better than 20. Um, I think that would probably be the preference of the principals. Um, and I'll just give you an example, um, not, to, not to overly um, beat a dead horse, but um, you know, when I was a high school principal in another district just to the west of us, um, we, we needed to have, um, we were implementing a new um, uh, math program and we needed a half day of development with our staff that wasn't built into the calendar. And so I had the flexibility to say to the community, hey, in two months on this day, we're going to take a half day because we've got to dig into these new materials. And it was a really nice option for us. Um, I know it's different here, but um, just wanted to, to share that for context. And that was why I think I originally suggested maybe some um, opportunity with enough notice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Question for Dr. Dimmick. Are, uh, are you raising the concern that the language here would bind us to make sure that we schedule the early release Wednesdays a year and a half in advance? Is that what you're concerned by? If, could we? The, when it, where it says we approved by the school board each December, what it was unclear to mm -hmm. me is, does that apply to the, f so for, for if we took this year as an example, would it apply to the, just the 2024-2025 school year, or would we be deciding the early releases at the high school for the 2025-26 school year? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this is a Ms. Minson question. Um, what if we change the adjective? What if we said these dates will be included in the approved school calendar by the school board each December? So that way it gives the flexibility for the superintendent and, and leadership to add the early release Wednesdays to an approved school calendar. If the point is still for the school board to vote on it, would it be the board coming back to the next year? Like, for example, looking at the calendars now, the board has adopted the 24-25 calendar. Under this policy as written, the school board could still reapprove that calendar with different early release Wednesdays or additional early release Wednesdays. Another option would be just to remove each December so if a calendar is approved by the school board, it can be modified and then approved again. So the board this December could approve the school calendar for 25-26. And then next December, when it's looking at the subsequent year, could add one or two early release Wednesdays for that next year. So doing it eight months out instead of the 20 months out. I see. I think in my, and this is just my perspective, but I feel like, I, I feel like I would be voting on 10 or 11 early release Wednesdays and letting the schools decide when those are scheduled. So I don't think I would be interested in having the approval of when those are scheduled and allow the flexibility, um, as the superintendent mentioned earlier. But that's just my opinion. But I think that's generally, Ms. Michael, isn't it, how we've done it is we're vote, don't we usually vote on the grid and then you give us the list? I can't remember. So you're correct in that we used to always have the school board vote on the grid and we never actually included the list until much later when we posted it on the web. Mm -hmm. This last year I do think we put the list together with the grid when we had the board approve it. But prior to that we always did the list with the early release dates much later. What if you just dropped the last part of that sentence that says these, said these dates will be included in the school calendar period? Then there's no approved by the school board each December. It's just we'll put it in the in the list. You just have to determine how many days it is that you want us to do, and we'll just make sure that they're out um, in the the list mm -hmm. uh, calendar. Would that be okay with everyone? I think it seems like a good compromise. 
because it would be, I, I see a thumbs up. I can't see Dr. Anderson's face, but I saw a thumbs up. Um, but I, uh, I think that's a good compromise because it gives um, Dr. Noon and his staff a little bit of flexibility, but it's also um, going to be in the same format as all the other early release Wednesdays. Okay, I think and that's if it, good. And if it gives a li little bit more comfort, these dates will be included in the school calendar prior to the start of the school year. Mm -hmm. then, then it's super clear that it's not going to just, like, show up on the 10th day of school that we've got right. on half day Wednesday. Right. So, um, so does anyone um, have feelings? Ten I think Ms. Tice, that was a great, uh, great suggestion that we'll maintain and have the range. So nine would I, nine would be the bottom. Um, does and everyone feel comfortable doing nine to eleven, or do you feel it should just be nine to ten? Yes, Dr. Anderson. I think nine to ten is fine. Um, I think the the concern that. I've been hearing from some uh, is just the March issue um, and really no other issue. Um, and so it doesn't seem like you need two extra uh, early release Wednesdays. You just maybe want one extra. Anyone else? Ms. Tice? I don't, I don't feel strongly. I would be happy to pass it either way. I just, if we went to 11, it might give the flexibility for some scenario like Dr. Noonan just outlined, but I don't feel strongly. Anyone else feel? I, I, I'm echoing Dr. Anderson's what I heard from the community, but I, again, I, I'm feeling not as strong either. So yeah. I mean, we could do um, nine to ten. We can always revisit the policy, or the next board can revisit the policy if there wants to be additional ones. You know, if the if. Uh, Mr. Lobb or, um, or Mr. Pickering came back and said this has been really helpful, this is how we've used it, we could use another one, we could always update the policy. Okay, I mean I just, I agree with you, I didn't, I don't think we like saw people, I, I thought we were, frankly, I thought we would see more students and teachers and, and, and we did a little bit but it just wasn't as as much as I thought. So, so I think 10 would be generous. Okay. Um, just looking at like we probably wouldn't do one in September, right? And probably have the first one in October. We wouldn't do one in June, so it gives us a little bit of flexibility. Okay. So, I think that'd be great. Okay, so we would say the second Ms. Minson, so the secondary campus will maintain between nine, nine and ten, nine to ten. <laughs> one idea would be just to say the secondary campus will maintain nine or ten early release sure. instead of between yeah, nine. Yeah, you're and the 10. you're the you're the attorney. I think the up to the idea was then there could be less less yeah 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 I think nine or ten would be good okay okay so sorry I'm going out of order but that was the one with the major uh, changes so um, we're gonna jump back up now um, so this was one um, that we did have a couple board members interested in actually having early release Wednesdays every week regardless of um, there being a holiday. And um, just to clarify, and I, I should have done this off offline, but um, just to give you a little history, um, that policy was not implemented because of religious holidays. I think there was a misunderstanding there. Th that happened before Dr. Noonan arrived, and this was something that his predecessor um, was not a fan of early release Wednesdays. And so um, she implemented that policy of having full Wednesdays on weeks when there was a holiday. Um, and that was her approach to try to have an off ramp for early release Wednesday. So just to, I just wanted to clarify that, that that was pl put in place before Dr. Noonan arrived. Um, that said, I know um, in talking with Dr. Noonan, I know that you have concerns doing that in terms of just, it's a loss of instruction time. Um, I know that parents, um, you know, we have the parents piece of it too. and and. I know the reason that this couple school board members mentioned it was that it does give more um, regularity. People can plan easier. It's easier to get staff to staff aftercare at, at the community center and, and um, our schools and our aftercare program. It, it's I think the East Hall community um, advocated for that as well. So, um, but you know, I, I personally wouldn't be supportive of it. Um, so I guess we just need to have a conversation about that. As it's written now, we wrote it so that um, we would keep it as is. But I just wanted to let you know there were a couple board members, two board members, who specifically had said that. So yes, Dr. Anderson. Yeah. So um, I think if we are to keep 
you know, early release Wednesdays. I think it's like I think we should make it as as good as we can. Um, and one of the consistent things that we heard about early release Wednesdays um, that were supportive but made it difficult was the inconsistency. Uh, we heard that I've heard that from some teachers. Um, I've heard that from many parents, and in particular, when we were at the Esau uh, Town Hall, that was one of the main things that they actually discussed was the inconsistency of early release Wednesdays. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I think I, I feel uh, I feel like this is important to acknowledge that the inconsistency is what makes it kind of hard on uh, many families. Um, and so, I wouldn't be supportive of the uh, of the policy as written. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Yes, Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, I think that um, Dr. Anderson is misinterpreting that feedback, especially from the ESOL community. And it wasn't necessarily a, a, a translation issue, so I'm not saying it's like that, that was it. It was just that I think we've heard that it can be confusing when, you know, because you know, the, the notion is like, oh, the policy is when there's a holiday, then there's no early release. Well, that's, you know, one of those things that's not, you know, that's in implicit in the calendar, but it's not like we advertise that. So what it is, it's a matter of confusion and communication and not one of like um, advocacy for having it normal. So I think I disagree with that characterization of that community being an advocate for such a thing. Um, you know, I think, you know, regularity, you know, maybe they would appreciate regularity, but it's not as if it came from a place of disagreeing with the policy or, or advocating for the change. So I think that, that that's a, a, somewhat of a misinterpretation. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Vice Chair Gould. Yeah, I, I think w the, the rationale for having a more consistent um, also came from the after, after care community. Um, the different providers said it's very hard to staff and they said it would be easier to staff and have that consistency of staff and if they can hire people and say every Wednesdays versus these two Wednesdays and that Wednesday. And so I think that coupled with the teachers that we heard this feedback from, um, and Dr. Ortiz, obviously you were the one you know, translating, but I, it did seem like that there was a, a desire for more consistency, however that's, you, that's defined. I do feel like that was coming from uh, that community as well. Um, I felt like we heard it from different different areas of the community. So um, maybe one compromise on this might be to allow, again, Dr. Noonan and his team to have flexibility on scheduling these earliest Wednesdays such that maybe there are certain earliest Wednesdays where it might make, might make, okay. I'm getting a look if you can no, see no, this keep, on camera. No, no, keep going. I, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I want the flexibility in this since it's going to be a policy. Okay. Like I, I would, my preference would be if you guys want to make a policy, make a policy um, to either do early release Wednesdays on days where there's, a, on weeks where there's a holiday or don't. Um, okay. I just, I worry because then it, if it's left to me. It that makes sense. That makes monkey. sense. Given the comments about the history of this, that makes sense. So, yeah. So we just heard it from different areas of the community. I don't I'd welcome other board members to speak up on what they heard and where they think. Yes, Ms. Tice. Um, I just, well, I remember those of us on this, well, a lot of us have had kids in the system since um, 2013 or earlier. And so I know, I just, I remember how light a week, a three and a half day week feels. Um, and I try and come back to what is in the best interest of the kids. I just don't, I don't want to keep defaulting to childcare, not that child, childcare isn't important. And I understand the burdens it puts on families. And I think we're all committed um, in light of our budget conversation earlier too, to be creative for child care solutions and and keep trying to improve the options and relieve some of that burden for students and families. But I just come back to, to what's best for the most students and I just feel like a three and a half day week is, is really too late. So I would, I would really prefer um, to keep it, the early release only on full weeks. Yes, Dr. Demick. I would also, um, I agree with Ms. Tice, would like to keep it as, as we are currently doing it, early release when there are full weeks. Um, I guess from what I heard from child care, uh, our child care provider was that it's just hard to hire people for Wednesday. It doesn't matter that it is not every week. It just, hiring someone just for Wednesday is really hard. Um, but I, I guess I'm in agreement when, if we have two teacher work days 
and an early release, that, that's a two-and-a-half-day week. Um, and when school starts, when you sort of want consistency and we have those, those two, you know, we have Labor Day and then we have that other holiday, those would, the, yeah, I think it, it'd be okay to keep it as it is. And I, I know, Dr. Noon, you had presented to us in a f uh, previous meeting that we are on the lower end of some of our instruction hours with surrounding communities, too. So I think then going down to, you know, a shorter week, yes, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, I would I would be uh, hesitant to use instruction time as a, as a reason for not going to every Wednesday um, because if we were going to be very concerned about instruction time, then we should get rid of ha earlier this Wednesday. Well, I think that we're supportive of well, not we're I am supportive of early release Wednesdays um, uh, for the things I've the reasons I've said before, um, you know, to support our teachers, um, but I think. In my opinion, personally, this is something that um, seems to have worked pretty well um, for our community to have have the full Wednesday um, to increase instruction time. So to me, it's sort of a, a compromise. It's supporting our students, but also not going so far that we're ending up with two and a half or three and a half school uh, school day weeks. Yes, Dr. Dimick. Yes, I also wanted to say while we're talking about early release, early release Wednesdays. Um, Earlier, we were talking about teacher shortages. Um, Dr. Ortiz, you mentioned, so what can we do to attract and retain teachers? We heard very loudly from our staff community that this is valuable time for them to um, do professional development, plan horizontally, and plan vertically. Maybe we're not always able to compete on salary with Arlington, but if we can offer teachers a better job than Arlington, Maybe they'll come here and stay here happily. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. I, of course, ag agree with you. I think that is, uh, you know, it's just so much doom and gloom about the teacher shortage. And I think, and, and I know, Ms. Tice, you've said it before, too. It's just, you know, we don't have to, we can be our own school system. We don't have to be, you know, because some have mentioned well, we're the only ones left with it. You know, that can be okay. Um, but I think is, if it's something that, you know, we can't, compete with salary or what have you, you know, so much of it. And, and also, not only that, but also teacher retention, morale, these are all things that um, our teachers have really come out in force um, to support. So I guess, so let me, i trying to read the room um, with this particular one. So Vice Chair Go, where are you on this, this piece of this? On specifically on, on the language about exclusion? Uh, yeah, about about have during weeks. I'm fine with as is for lines uh, six through eight based on the reasons that we discussed. Okay, so you'd be okay. Okay, so I think that we have then the majority. We have um, myself and Vice Chair Gould and Ms. Tyson, Dr. Dimick at the, at the least that are supportive with the language as is. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Tice. Uh, just before we move forward, I had a comment about. Um, the final paragraph. Yeah, I was Wednesday. getting to that. Yeah, I was going oh, to. Okay, I was not trying to jump <laughs> So, Ms. Tice, Sorry. I know you have some <laughs> feedback on non-Wednesday non early release days. Please. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just so anxious. Um, <laughs> I, very small thing, but when we met with the administration at the secondary campus, they did make a point to say that although the early release days at the end of the school year are very valuable, they're not necessarily used for final exams anymore as they as they used to be. So if we could change the wording to something, you know, final assessments or something along those lines so that it's clear, <coughs> it's um, more accurate of how the days are really being used, I think that would be appreciated. Is that good? Yeah, no, no problem. I'd be happy to do could that. Could you clarify what the difference is? What, I think an exam implies like sitting and taking a test, mm -hmm. but the, a lot of times they're you know they're performance based things, they're presentations or they're projects or present you know they're not sitting and just taking like a written test, and so, which exam I think implies that um, there's just other activities at the end of the year instead. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Okay, so um, I think Ms. Minson, um, I guess we should probably pull these out. For the motion, I'm thinking because you know someone might want to vote for one but not vote for the other. Um, does that make sense? I think that would be fine. Um, one point of cl clarification for policy CE: mm -hmm. if we, I could just be clear so I can edit this up yes, for the yes, board. Yes, please. For um, line 12, it'll say the secondary campus will maintain 
9 or 10 early release Wednesdays per year. Will line 13 end at these dates will be included in the school calendar? Or will it read these dates will be included in the school calendar prior to the start of the school year? I didn't get a sense of the board on. I think prior, prior to the prior to start of school yeah, year. Yeah, prior to the start of school year. Then back to your question, I think it would be fine to have um, two motions. First, that the school board approve first reading of CD, secondary school start times, take a vote on that, and then that the school board approve, approve first reading of policy CE early recent Wednesdays <coughs> as amended. As amended, right. Okay. But we don't, we did not amend um, CD, so we don't need that language there. Correct. Okay. Um, okay, so if we, um, if someone could, so the first motion would just be um, that the school board approve the first reading of policy CD, if someone, would, um, sec CD comma secondary school start times. Yes, Vice Chair Gould. I recommend that the school board approve first reading of policy CD secondary school start times. Thank you. Could I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Tice. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 Okay, and um, I guess do we do roll call on that? I was just gonna say, yeah, yeah. Please, please, Ms. Goodell. Okay, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Dr. Gould. Yes. Dr. Ortiz. No. Ms. Silverman. No. And Ms. Tice. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. Okay, and then now we need a motion. Um, for that the school board the motion would be that the school board approve policy ce early release wednesday as amended yes dr dimick chair i move that the school board approve policy ce early release early release wednesdays as amended thank you could i have a second can i clarify oh, yeah. the motion the yeah. first reading of oh i'm sorry thank yeah, you sorry. thank I you i move that the school board approve first reading of policy ce early release wednesdays as amended thank you dr dimmick could i have a second thank you Ms. tice all those in favor say yes yes all those opposed say no no okay Ms. goodell could you take the roll thank you dr anderson no dr dimmick yes Ms. downs yes dr gould yes dr ortiz no Ms. Silverman? No. And Ms. Tice? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Thank you all. And again, thank you to everyone for your input um, and your work over these past six plus months and I know this is, as I mentioned, I know this is, this was a harder vote and, you know, this is, you know, something that I think we all approach differently, but I really appreciate everyone keeping an open mind and um, talking through these issues. And, you know, we're all doing what we think is, is best for the community and best for our students and, and teachers and parents. And so, um, you know, I know that we all are coming from this, at, coming from a good place. Um, you know, we all just have different thoughts about this, but I do appreciate everyone's um, time to really talk this through and, and, uh, and, the community's um, time that they took meeting with us at town halls and feedback from the staff and so just thank you again um, to everyone for this and we'll we'll do a second reading at our uh, next meeting our final meeting of the calendar year okay and um, so we're now at 4.01 and this is just materials for board review so this is the monthly budget report and then we're at 5.01 closed meeting and um, after we'll adjourn after this closed meeting so we'll be um, turning off the streaming from here. If um, someone could please read us into closed. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Legal matters under section 2.2-3711A7 in particular, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body and legal matters under section 2.2-3711A8 in particular consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by the public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Thank you. Could I have a second? second. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. We're going to move into closed. And thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. And thank you to the staff for joining us.